Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to discuss USAID's foreign policy and international development priorities in the era of great power competition. I recognize myself for an opening statement. I want to thank you, Administrator uh, Powers, for joining us here today. I've enjoyed working with you over the years as the United States continues to address the many challenges uh, that we face in the world today. USAID is the U.S. government's primary humanitarian and development assistance organization in the world. They are the people who bring food to starving children, bring medicine to the sick and dying, help rebuild schools and bridges and roads when war or natural disasters have washed them away, and we're seeing quite a bit of that uh, today. And that is our soft power. And that's why I think it's critical that USAID have a cohesive strategy to grow America's soft influence while using U.S. taxpayer money as effectively and efficiently as possible. One of the biggest success stories of U.S. assistance is PEPFAR. To date, over 25 million lives have been saved. The President of Botswana personally told me that PEPFAR has, quote, saved a generation from extinction. And at the same time, it serves as one of the America's best soft diplomacy tools. I'm pleased to say that PEPFAR has been reauthorized. The budget you have submitted to our committee has some good provisions to project American leadership. However, much of this budget reads more like a wish list than a strategic document to promote American leadership. The Chinese Communist Party poses a generational threat to the United States. And now more than ever, American diplomacy is critical to counter the CCP's growing influence. They use debt trap diplomacy through their Belt and Road Initiative, and alarmingly, to some extent, they are succeeding. In this great struggle for global balance of power, the choices are clear, freedom and democracy, or oppression and tyranny. Yet this budget seems to place a higher priority on DEI programs and combating CCP's malign influence. The budget includes $3 billion earmarked for, quote, inclusive gender equity and another $200 million for, quote, gender equity and quality action fund. Imposing these political ideologies is not uh, aid in my judgment. Now I'd like to turn to Afghanistan, where the Biden administration's chaotic and deadly withdrawal create a massive humanitarian crisis that we are dealing with today. We know for a fact that taxpayer funding aid is flowing to Taliban fighters and loyalists rather than suffering Afghan women and children. Hard fought gains to advance women's rights and promote democracy and stability in Afghanistan were wiped out by the decision to unilaterally withdraw. Today, Afghanistan is the most oppressive country in the world for women and girls. Girls have been banned from attending school. Women are banned from working for NGOs. This greatly diminishes the ability to get aid to women and children and the people who need it the most, and it further limits our oversight capabilities. The U.S. must adamantly oppose this treatment of Afghan women and girls, and we must work with our friends and allies to pressure the Taliban to lift these edicts. Turning to the Western Hemisphere, the crisis at our southern border is the worst I've seen in my entire career. I continue to believe that it is a direct cause and effect of this administration rescinding the migrant protection protocols known as Remain in Mexico. USA plays and must continue to play a critical role in combating the root causes of this migration. We need to turn off the magnet of open borders and the lack of enforcement of our immigration laws, which is creating this crisis at our border. So finally, Administrator Power, I want to thank you, though, for being uh, open and accessible uh, and listening to me. We may not always agree. We can agree to disagree, but we can always agree to have that conversation 
about what's most important for the American people. And I want to thank you personally uh, for that. And with that, uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I definitely want to say thank you to Administrator Powell uh, for you joining us today, but all of your tireless work just trying to help people, just trying to feed people, just trying to show the very best of what the United States represents. Uh, your work and what you uh, do on a continuous uh, manner uh, should be uh, really important. You know, you lead a very vital agency at a time when USAID's work its investments in development, in resilience, and in stability is desperately needed almost every place around the planet. You know, over the last year alone, Russia has intensified its brutal war against Ukraine. Gang violence in Haiti has accelerated the humanitarian crises there. The bloody conflict in Sudan has displaced millions of people and created the world's largest hunger crisis. And Israel, has faced the deadliest terrorist attack in decades, and the people of Gaza are now facing famine. You know, what? yet, despite the increased need for USAID's important work, I see my friends on the other side of the aisle want to cut your budget by as much as 12%. <clears throat> Though we Democrats pushed back against these short-sighted cuts, we were disappointed that the fiscal year 24 appropriations bill ultimately included a 6% cut to foreign assistance. And many of us who supported that bill, we only supported it because we wanted to avert a shutdown, which would have had a devastating, which would have had devastating consequences. And we must pass delayed national security supplemental that passed overwhelmingly in the Senate on a bipartisan basis, which contains over $9 billion for humanitarian assistance. That's something that we need to pass. We must pass. We must get it on the floor. We must pass it. We cannot build a safer, more prosperous world if Congress continues to gut diplomacy and development. And I expect my Republican colleagues will ask you, Madam uh, Administrator, how can the U.S. counter China's malign influence around the world while at the same time what they're doing is failing to provide you the funding needed to invest and the very tools required to compete? That's how we combat China, is by funding you and giving you the tools that is necessary as we are cutting your budget China is increasing its. That's no way to stop China's influence. Ukraine, already starved of ammunition, as the GOP fails to bring forward a supplemental, has seen half of its energy infrastructure destroyed by Russia. Putin's war of choice decimated Ukraine's agriculture industry, which drives up food prices globally, as well as that's what causes inflation globally also, we must do something immediately in that regard. And it also robs Ukraine of precious revenues keeping its economy afloat during this war. In Sudan, the civil war between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces has led to devastating violence. And we are seeing the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war against ethnic minorities and a humanitarian crisis deepened by the blocking of humanitarian aid. Eight million people have been displaced, and famine conditions are expected by this summer in Sudan. And of course, in Gaza, we've seen this conflict has resulted in the destruction of more than 60% of homes, 31% of children under the age two, and are acutely malnutrition and famine is imminent or already occurring. So I look forward to hearing from you, Administrator Powell, and how USAID, USAID can work to address this acute crisis, particularly as UNRWA funding remains suspended. We must do more to address the crisis in Haiti, which is engulfed in a growing catastrophe. Gangs now control more than 80% of Port-au-Prince. These criminal gangs are responsible for extrajudicial killings, arms trafficking, 
systemic, systematic sexual and gender-based violence, looting, and unprecedented coordinated attacks against Haitian government institutions. They have blocked the passage of water, supplies, and food, threatening widespread hunger and public health crises. You know, 5.5 million people, nearly half of the country's population, including 3 million children, are reliant upon humanitarian assistance for their livelihoods. And of course, we cannot speak about USAID's role in addressing the development needs of Haiti without a conversation regarding its security. The multinational security support mission in Haiti is vital for turning the corner on Haiti's security. But again, my Republican colleagues continue to block U.S. funding support, the MSS funding, that has already been approved by Congress. USAID plays an indispensable role in how the U.S. addresses all of these challenges. The foreign assistance that USAID administers is not a handout, but a strategic investment in our future that is vital for U.S. global leadership and a stable, more resilient world, and the work is needed to be done now more than ever. And let me just conclude real quickly by stating that none of these challenges can be properly addressed without talented and dedicated workers at USAID. And investing in their success, I urge you, Administrator Power, to continue your efforts to ensure the agency's workforce reflects the diversity. Diversity is important. In this country, in this country's history, we must always, re diversity is strength. It's strength and an example for others to follow. The diversity of the American people is important, including further expansion of USAID's successful educational partnership with minority-serving institutions. And with that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields. Um, other members are reminded that opening statements may be uh, submitted for the record. We're pleased uh, to have here today the 19th USAID Administrator, Samantha Power, before us. Today, your full statement will be made part of the record. I now recognize you for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you as well, Ranking Member Meeks, all of you who've made time uh, to be here today. I know how much is going on. Order. The committee will come to order. The committee will come to order. The committee will come to order. Come to order. All yeah. the committee will come to order. The chair instructs the Capitol Police to remove the protesters from the committee room. The committee will recess until order is restored pending the call of the chair. Are we coming to order? Administrator, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start, I, I will come, in fact, of course, to discussing Gaza, but um, start with just uh, an image uh, to put in your minds, um, taken from the lobby of the Republic of Korea's development agency which is their equivalent today of USAID. Um, in the lobby, they display an old bag of flour from the 1940s, marked with the words from the American people, which of course is what we put on all of our uh, USAID programming uh, around the world. This bag of flour, uh, the remnants of it, is a reminder of how the United States supported the people of Korea when they were one of the poorest countries on the planet. Today, of course, South Korea is one of the world's richest nations, and last year they spent nearly $4 billion providing aid to other nations. This year, they plan to increase that by 30%. Uh, that is the Republic of Korea's story, and that is the story of how the United States over time has supported countries in charting their own paths of development uh, a journey that has brought extraordinary results, not only for our partners, but for our own people. We have helped stop the spread of diseases that threaten us all. We have helped develop more resilient, high-yield crops that can feed growing populations. We have helped people and nations rise up from poverty 
and in doing so, also invested billions in American small businesses, opening up markets as well uh, for American products. Eight of our top 10 trading partners today were once the recipients of U.S. assistance. Under President Biden's leadership and in partnership with this committee, with whom we work really closely, we are building on uh, that remarkable legacy. In Ukraine, U.S. aid has helped farmers withstand Putin's brutal attempts to destroy the agricultural sector. Using resources that you all mobilized in the supplementals, we have been able to get those farmers the seeds, the equipment, and help them build the alternative export routes that they needed while they obtained uh, a military and logistic uh, capability to reopen uh, the Black Sea grain route uh, that had, of course, been such a major export route before Putin's full-scale invasion. Just to, to pause for a second on what that work has produced, Ukraine has actually rebounded its grain export numbers to near pre-war levels, some, some months even exceeding what they were able to export in the agricultural sector. That is just remarkable. But it also uh, has had the effect of helping bring down global grain prices by 26% since their high point in 2022. In Nigeria, we are providing community health workers with X-ray and portable artificial intelligence technologies to spot diseases like tuberculosis early, which has helped increase TB diagnoses by a third in a single year so that patients can get treatment and outbreaks don't spread across the planet. Across Africa, we are working to connect African and American companies and reduce barriers to trade through the Prosper Africa Initiative efforts that since 2019 have generated some $86 billion in trade and investment, again, building prosperity not only for our African partners, but also for those businesses that have been connected uh, here at home. Bipartisan support for these efforts makes Americans safer and more prosperous and provides a critical foundation for American influence in a world where other global powers, as the chairman and ranking member Meeks have alluded to, those other powers are working aggressively to erode U.S. alliances and diminish basic rights and freedoms around the world. For example, the PRC's global lending spree has made the PRC now the world's largest debt collector. That is uh, 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 a, a, an important fact and one that I think we need to do more uh, to communicate about. For every dollar of assistance that the PRC provides to low-income and middle-income countries, the PRC has provided $9 of debt. So for every dollar of grant, $9 in debt. The opposite is true of the United States. For every dollar of debt we provide, we provide at least $9 of assistance. The PRC's assistance, as you all know, tends to be negotiated behind closed doors, which helps fuel corruption and can often uh, give rise to programs and initiatives that show a flagrant disregard for human rights. One famous example is the Safe Cities uh, Initiative, whereby the PRC has provided surveillance and facial recognition technology that can monitor critics, journalists, and activists, and that technology has been provided to more than 80 countries. We need American leadership to advance different models of development and governance models that honor freedom, transparency, dignity, and opportunity for all. The Biden-Harris administration's FY 2025 request of $28.3 billion for USAID's fully and partially managed accounts give us the resources to continue that leadership. With these funds, we will help nations around the world strengthen food security, improve health, and drive economic growth. We will also respond to historic levels of humanitarian need. USAID teams have been working day and night to address the catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where nearly the entire population is living under the threat of famine. Samantha Powers, you know you're an expert in genocide. Where is that? Can Committee will come to order. I am a nurse. Healthcare workers. Committee will come to order. They're executing doctors. The, co the committee will suspend while the Capitol Police restore order. They're, they're, they are doing limb amputations. Committee will suspend until Capitol Police restore order.
Capitol Police will remove protesters from the committee room. No more outbursts. You may proceed, Administrator. I will, and I will wrap up here uh, shortly. Combining, again, the response to the catastrophe in Gaza, uh, we are also, of course, working to address the crises that you mentioned in Ukraine, Sudan, and beyond, and a growing number of natural disasters that are battering vulnerable people. To put this in numbers, the number of people in humanitarian need, needing humanitarian assistance, has increased by nearly a third from 274 million in 2022 to 363 million at the end of last year, at the end of 2023. Increasing by that amount in such a short period of time really speaks to the level of need out there. So we will need both the $10 billion in this budget request that you have before you, but also, as has been mentioned, desperately need the $10 billion in the emergency humanitarian assistance in the pending national security supplemental. If we don't get these resources, we will be forced to make draconian cuts uh, in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan, the list goes on. I want to just wrap up by talking about our recognition, though, also of the need for trade-offs and the need for cost-effectiveness. This budget gives us specific resources to help us de deliver better value for money. We just last year inaugurated a new office of the chief economist, and that team is already expanding our use of rigorous analysis across the agency to identify those programs that can give us the highest impact per dollar invested, the so-called Best Buy, so that those can be scaled. I'll give you just one quick example where this team identified a poverty reduction program in Uganda, which is offering a sequence set of supports, like trainings and financial services, that help refugees move from needing humanitarian assistance to earning sustainable livelihoods for themselves. For every dollar being invested in that program, households are seeing over four times the return in economic benefits, and we are now expanding it to other nations. You have given us the ability to launch something called the EDGE Fund, which is an incentive fund to fuel public-private partnerships, and it is designed to apply the private sector's unique comparative advantages to some of the largest global development challenges. This these seed resources give us catalytic and de-risking money to work with companies like Citibank, Walmart, Johnson & Johnson, the list goes on. And I'm very proud, Mr. Chairman, working with you, the ranking member, and others. We have between FY... Committee will suspend while the Capitol Police restore order. Committee will come to order. Administrator, you may proceed. Simply to say that in trying to catalyze far more private sector investment, we have been successful in growing uh, public-private partnerships and private sector partner contributions to USAID activities uh, by over 60%, just since FY21. Uh, to continue to drive that progress, we need to keep investing in our workforce, make sure that it is nimble and empowered to pursue truly catalytic change. If we do make these investments, I have no doubt we can continue America's extraordinary legacy of leadership in building a more secure and prosperous world for all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Administrator. Let me just say I, I admire and appreciate your passion that you bring to this job, and it is a very uh, difficult job that carries a lot of responsibility. Um, I want to turn to Afghanistan. Uh, we heard testimony from uh, Generals McKenzie and Milley about the withdrawal. Uh, committee will come to order. Committee will suspend until Capitol Police escort the protesters out. And what was clear in that testimony is that Ambassador Wilson believed that we could hold on to the embassy and keep the flag flying because, in his view, he believed we could normalize relations with the Taliban. But that didn't work out so well. Now the Taliban is in control of the country. 
And I talked about the impact on the women and girls in that country. We have provided $2 billion since August of 2021. And SIGAR produced its report that revealed, as I feared, that U.S. cash shipments do, in fact, benefit the Taliban. My question is, how do you plan to revise this program to ensure the Taliban is not benefiting from this assistance? In other words, what is your alternative to cash payments? Well, um, one of the reasons that the voucher system has become a system of choice in many parts of the world is we are, of course, interested in working uh, to ensure that citizens are not dependent on humanitarian assistance. And one of the things that vouchers do is they allow markets to get created, uh, you know, shopkeepers to make money, uh, goods to be procured um, and, and manufactured locally. So cash programs are an important part of the solution through vouchers. But they are also useful because vouchers uh, allow for more transparency, you know, uh, where, where the money is going. So we are continually assessing our activities. As you know, we work only with trusted partners like the World Food Program, UNICEF, and others that we work with all around the world. Um, in Afghanistan, beyond our standard rigorous controls and assurances and the requirement that every implementing partner has to report any diversion, we have independent third-party monitoring that does site visits uh, and tries to scrutinize, the, the, scrutinize those transactions. Um, again, we've seen partners that we fund actually suspending assistance uh, because of uh, the diversion or because women are not allowed to be employed, depending, there's two sets of reasons uh, to suspend. Um, and then after conditions change, restarting assistance. So happy to work uh, with your can team. Can I ask you about that? Because yep. they, the NGOs were prohibited from hiring women. Um, has that changed? And what have you done to try to help change that well, I, policy? I, most of the UN or the UN system came together and developed a set of principles whereby women had to be beneficiaries of the resources, of course, and that uh, women aid workers had to be part of, of delivery. I would say enforce the Taliban edict remains the same. Enforcement is uneven, and what our partners have done is find ways to maneuver around it. Uh, so as to ensure that women continue to be part of the delivery system in some form. That doesn't always mean it is the same form in which it occurred uh, prior to the, the fall of Kabul and the takeover by the Taliban. Well, yeah, I just want to ensure that the U.S. taxpayer dollars are not directly funding the Taliban. I'm, I know you can't completely assure that, and it's, it's um, uh, troubling. Uh, we're facing a similar issue with Haiti until they have some form of government, it's hard to provide that assistance as, as I very much know how desperately it's needed uh, and I'm very empathetic to the people of Haiti. Let me shift to your role as not just administrator of USAID, but you sit on the board of MCC and the Development Finance Corporation. These are the three main US agencies that really can combat the malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party. You, you talked about this in your opening statement. Uh, we are looking at ways to be more effective against the Belt and Road policies. Um, can you uh, comment on that? But specifically, we are working on a bipartisan bill to uh, reform the Development Finance Corporation where we can provide them with more equity so that you can have more private investment in these countries that are almost held hostage to this debt trap that you talked about that the CCP gets them into. Um, thank you, and thank you for your leadership uh, in securing the passage of the BUILD Act in the first place and, and putting the D in development finance in the Development Finance Corporation. We work really closely uh, with the DFC. As I've made clear to, to Scott Nathan uh, and the DFC leadership, you know, we view USA teams all around the world. We have missions in more than 100 countries, um, or programs in more than 100 countries, missions in more than 80 countries. That's our ground game for deal spotting, uh, for creating regulatory reform that makes it possible then for the private sector to come in, uh, whether partnering with DFC or, or not. So we're pretty heartened by where the partnership is going. About 20% of DFC's transactions this year 
were supported by USAID in some fashion. I think that can be even higher. Uh, with regard to scoring, uh, I know OMB and DFC are in touch and hoping to come forward with compromised language. There are different views on, on, on that, of course, up here on the Hill and within the administration. Um, but, but it would be uh, extremely important that something be achieved in that regard, not least because um, even though we want to see DFC grow uh, and know it needs to grow, particularly in light of uh, geopolitical competition and in light of the infrastructure and other needs around the world, um, everything comes out of the same pot of resource-constrained uh, money. And, and so fundamentally, uh, a scoring fix would also be very advantageous for us being able to grow our public-private partnerships, our economic growth programming, our efforts to help countries deal with debt that they've incurred through working with the PRC. And I think the issue is the, the way it's scored by OMB, it doesn't take into account the return on the investment that they get per dollar. And I know the ranking member uh, and I are in agreement on this. I've worked and I've been talking to Senator Coons on the Senate side, and we are working uh, in a bipartisan way like we normally do on this committee to uh, reform this so it can work the way that Congress envisioned uh, it to work. And I appreciate your uh, candor on this. It'll be helpful uh, in terms of final passage. Uh, with that, the chair now recognizes the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, Administrator Power for leading in USAID and the role that USAID has played in trying to address the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. USAID and several other international partners have raised the alarm about the risk of famine in Gaza, particularly in the north, where evidence indicates famine is imminent or possibly already happening. And with the tragic killing of seven World Central Kitchen employees in a drone strike, I fear humanitarian assistance delivery will become even more challenging. So could you please uh, update the committee on the status of food security in Gaza and what we are doing to address it beyond waiting for the construction of a temporary Department of Defense pier? Um, thank you. Um, well, let me just say that the, the conditions are as dire uh, as any I have seen in my career. Um, and we have made some progress, I would say, a particular acceleration of progress in the last few days with more throughput, you know, more food and material getting into Gaza. We we're over 400 trucks today, uh, or uh, yesterday and the day before, uh, and those are the first time that we've been able to, to clear that number. But we need to go way beyond that because um, in addition to the fact that there were 500 trucks getting in commercial and humanitarian uh, before October 7th, the level of destruction, as was alluded to, I think, by you in your opening statement, uh, the destruction of granaries and markets and arable land, um, and then the fact that so few trucks got in over so many months means we have massive catch-up to do if we together are to avoid uh, the worst form of famine uh, imaginable. So. Uh, again, you had very little, almost no child malnutrition uh, before uh, October 7th, uh, and you now have uh, a massive spike. Uh, uh, and, and particularly in, in the north, one in three uh, kids are suffering from malnutrition. Um, and again, the, the reports of famine also spreading to the south uh, makes sense, again, because so little uh, assistance has gotten in commensurate to the needs of more than 2 million people. Thank you for that. And, and as you also know, I uh, continue to be deeply concerned for the people of Haiti. Uh, in fact, last month, both you and Secretary Blinken responded to this crisis announcing new humanitarian assistance funding for Haiti, totaling more than $58 million. And, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I want to support programs that alleviate the suffering of the Haitian people, reduce violence, and support the peaceful transition of power in a process that is Haitian-owned and led. So my question to you, Madam Administrator, is how is USAID addressing these objectives in the immediate and long term, and what steps is USAID taking to ensure community-led organizations inside Haiti and the diaspora are included in programming planning for planning and implementation? Thank you. Well, uh, 
with, with great difficulty is the is the the short answer, particularly uh, because of the breakdown of of law and order in the capital and and the uh, the gang takeover of many neighborhoods that until recently were were stable. Uh, Haiti has been challenged uh, in terms of lawlessness and gang violence for a long time, but it, this is certainly um, a scale of violence that we have not seen uh, before. I will say that most of USAID's uh, programs outside of the capital are still functioning. 92% of the clinics that you help us fund uh, are still operational uh, in Haiti. We are um, at working, of course, with the State Department um, in looking at ways we will be in a position to support the political transition that needs to move forward, has needed to move forward, as you well know, and a message you've delivered many times. Um, uh, because, you know, again, the political, the security, the humanitarian, they all they all go together. Um, and so the, the Transitional Council uh, needs to move forward, need to assume uh, temporary powers, but then move quickly to elections. At the same time, we really need this multinational security uh, uh, police support force, uh, police force to, to be able to deploy. Um, in addition, that will then uh, make it easier to resume training of the Haitian National Police, who have really been courageous in trying to stand up to the gangs in these recent uh, weeks of deterioration. Um, but we can't look at just the political or just the humanitarian, or we'll be in, in stopgap security, political, humanitarian, we need to deploy resources against all of those. And therefore, I hope, really sincerely hope that the holes will be lifted on the support that we are trying to provide the Kenyans so that they can get the pre-deployment training and equipment that they need to be able to do the job when they do deploy. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. If I could just uh, um, add to that, I have requested a briefing from the National Security Council on this very issue. Um, I want to be supportive, but until I've been briefed on what the plan is and where the money and guns are going to, I cannot in good conscience send money and guns down to a lawless society without a government. We have a long history in this country of arming countries uh, with weapons and cash, and it blows back on us. I want to make sure that what we're doing here is makes sense, um, not only for the American taxpayer, but for the Haitian people, because if we arm the warlords and fund them, they will be the victims. The people of Haiti will be the victims. So uh, with that, I recognize uh, Ms. Young Kim. Thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Mix for holding today's foreign assistance budget hearing. I want to thank uh, Administrator Samantha Power for joining us and for your testimony. I especially appreciated your reference to South Korea. After the Korean War, obviously, Korea has now become one of the economic superpower. And now, as you mentioned, they are now from recipient country to become a powerful donor country, providing $4 billion to help other countries. So that is remarkable success story. And obviously, you make a very good case of why we need to continue to uh, stay engaged in U.S. providing foreign especially development assistance. Um, so today, um, with Japanese Prime Minister coming to Washington, D.C. and addressing the uh, joint sessions of Congress this week, I wanted to raise the trilateral relationship between the United States, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, I support the increased collaboration within this relationship on global development and health issues, particularly as Japan and South Korea emerged as leading bilateral donors, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, I recently welcomed Assistant uh, Administrator Schiffer to my office so we can discuss the issue ahead of uh, myself and uh, Congressman Ami Bera leading a bipartisan delegation on our trip to South Korea. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that and ask you if uh, you can share USAID's efforts to leverage this emerging relationship to increase cooperation on development and global health issues with our Indo-Pacific allies. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for all of your leadership on so many of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, you know, I think this is one of the most uh, exciting uh, growth areas uh, that I've seen. You know, I was part of the Obama administration for eight years, I was out for four years, then came back. 
And um, it's really a sea change in our ability to sit down uh, with our Korean and Japanese partners and you know, brainstorm and plan together. We, we see it happening at the country level. Uh, in Ghana, as you probably were briefed by uh, Assistant Administrator Schiffer, uh, we have a trilateral memorandum of cooperation on universal health coverage, where we each try to leverage our specific areas of expertise and bring them to bear in a coordinated way. Um, one of the things I've only actually uh, begun to sort of dig into the details on is we, in September of last year, I believe it was, uh, signed a new memorandum of cooperation looking at electricity transmission lines in, uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're looking together between us, uh, uh, the Koreans and the Japanese, through Power Africa uh, to develop 1,500 kilometers of new transmission lines to, to end energy poverty. Um, and this follows the successful development of 2,000 kilometers of transition lines under the previous agreements. So I think you'll, you'll start to see almost a contagion here as, as missions get the experience of working trilaterally, begin to branch out from health to agriculture to education, et cetera. Uh, but we're really trying to push it from headquarters. Thank you. You know, I also recently traveled to Southeast Asia uh, where partners are eager to work with the United States and they are in desperate need of many of USAID's programs, particularly in the capacity building area and technical assistance. Uh, this is urgent. Given the growing influence of the Chinese Communist Party in the region, and as U.S. allies in the, in the Pacific, such as South Korea, Japan, we're talking about, and Taiwan, uh, they have adopted their own strategies to bolster their development programming in Southeast Asia. So can you talk about how USAID is working with our allies in Northeast Asia to pursue the co-development or co-financing programmings in the Southeast Asia? Thank you. Um, well, I think what, what I saw on my visit last year uh, to Vietnam is uh, that the, the kinds of relationships we were just discussing, again, are playing out at the ambassadorial level, at the embassy level. Our, one of our great comparative advantages as the United States is that we have these large teams uh, at our missions constituted largely of citizens of the countries in which we work. So in Vietnam, that's hundreds of Vietnamese who work uh, for the US government in pursuit of development. And that is something we offer to our Japanese and our Korean counterparts and say, look, we have the spotters, a little bit like what I was saying on Development Finance Corporation, uh, to ascertain where together we can make, make the greatest impact. So you know, I think I hope to have more examples uh, uh, to offer. I think uh, clean energy transition in Indonesia is already uh, an area of collaboration. Um, in Vietnam, work in the Mekong uh, together. And, you know, just as I was saying, with the PRC now the world's largest debt collector, there is a real opening. And, and notwithstanding all of the PRC investments in recent years, you're actually seeing a fairly precipitous decline in their investments through the Belt and Road Initiative and into infrastructure. That creates really important possibilities for the president's uh, global initiative on infrastructure as well to be something that we do together trilaterally with the Japanese and the Koreans. Thank you very much for the great work that you do. I look forward to continuing our conversation. Me too. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyway, yields. Mr. Sherman is recognized. Yield 30 seconds to the ranking member. Yeah, I just want to thank the chairman for um, agreeing to look at and, and to consider freezing, unfreezing the money they're going to Haiti. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we tried to set up a meeting with, uh, with the uh, NSC before we left, but our schedule didn't work out. So hopefully we'll be able to schedule something, whether it's this week, I'll talk to your staff, but it's really important that we schedule that meeting uh, very shortly so we can see if we can release that money because the Kenyans and the MSS uh, for, you know, uh, forces will need that, that I appreciate that. And perhaps the administrator can help facilitate the meeting. It shouldn't be that difficult to, to get a briefing, for God's sakes, I would think. So. Yes. Thank you. Uh, speaking of briefings, I'm seeking a classified briefing on Israeli deployments and preparedness on October 6th. And uh, I hope to work with, uh, I've been assured that I can get it for myself, but I'd rather have it for the whole committee. I look forward to working with leadership. Uh, I see in the audience my friend Sufi Lagari, who has worked tirelessly for human rights in uh, southern Pakistan, Sindh. And uh, I want to recognize that this is the second anniversary of the disappearance and likely abduction 
of seven-year-old Priya Kumari, a Hindu girl uh, in Sin province, uh, who uh, perhaps like uh, so many others uh, have been subject to uh, abductions, forced conversions, and forced marriages. Um, Ms. Powers, um, you do the most important work perhaps in the world. Uh, we are face, and, and I want to thank you for doing it. Um, we've got the supplemental bill that's come over from the Senate. And all the talk is that's money for Ukraine, money for Israel, perhaps uh, Taiwan. But there's a lot of money in that bill for humanitarian purposes. Some of it, Cong Congress explicitly indicates where you're supposed to spend the money. And the rest, we give the administration discretion. If we pass that bill, uh, can we be assured that assuming the security conditions are, are, are adequate so that you can actually operate and you know things can deteriorate, we realize, can, they, can we be sure that money will be spent in Armenia, in Tigray, in Sudan? Yes, and I'm happy to elaborate. And uh, Eastern Congo and the Rohingya refugee camps uh, in uh, Myanmar? Uh, correction, in uh, Bangladesh? Yes, and uh, maybe I just, just because you often ask about Ethiopia specifically, I just give you one fact as to why mm -hmm. <laughs> this is so very urgent. Um, the humanitarian response plan in Ethiopia right now, which is, you know, is not something that's been mentioned prior to you mentioning it, uh, is the proposals for 3.2 billion people. That's, the, uh, excuse me, $3.2 billion. That's the level of need. 15.5 uh, uh, million people. It is 4% funded right now. Oh my God. We are way down. We obviously in terms have of where to. I do want to move on. And, and I think uh, the ranking member, of course, brought up the humanitarian needs in Haiti and Gaza. And I believe that money from that supplemental bill would go there as well, security conditions uh, uh, permitted, correct? Correct, correct. Uh, now, a, a somewhat harder question. Um, there are two reasons to give foreign aid one, it's the moral right thing to do. And the second, the title of this hearing, that it helps our uh, geopolitical position. And we all were politicians. We recognize that cutting the ribbon, that taking credit for good things is important politically. And so you have people on the ground who tend to just want to focus on getting the job done, feeding the hungry people. We had resistance 10, 15 years ago against even putting the flag on the bag because we had partners who didn't like America. They wanted the American grain. And so um, obviously you cannot legally give money to any uh, uh, terrorist organization uh, or any organization that provides material aid to terrorist organizations. But is your part of your process in deciding which partners to fund looking at whether those organizations use their very powerful and U.S. enhanced bully pulpit to attack America and its allies or to support our, our foreign policy? How do you get people in your organization who just want to feed people to care about the second reason we fund foreign aid, the geopolitical? Well, let me actually uh, thank the chairman because uh, some of the legislation that his team and maybe working with, with you have initiated on branding is, is really, really important because if, if, it's if actually I, the law. I, I, I'm particularly concerned that an organization very close to Hamas, rhetorically at least, uh, is getting and has over many years, and while they've supported Hamas uh, rhetorically, been getting aid from USAID, and I'll put additional material in the record and provide it for you as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joan Yields, Chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. I uh, thank the Chairman, uh, and thank you, Ms. Powers, for being here. For decades, the United States has promoted global prosperity and self-sufficiency through its international development programs, uh, an approach that recognizes the dignity and inherent value of our partner countries. China, on the other hand, uh, uses its so-called development programs to exploit and uh, coerce. But instead of empowering countries to resist China's influence and pursue prosperity, the administration is pushing its radical agenda on our development partners, sacrificing effectiveness and efficiency in service of unrealistic and I think unfair climate goals. Administrative power, according to the Atlantic Council, China's investment 
if sub-Saharan energy infrastructure grew by a factor of 10 over the 2010s, and more than half of the $52 billion in energy loans issued by China's two main development finance institutions between 2000 and 2022 were allocated to fossil fuels. Our partners simply want greater access to electricity for their people. They should, this should, should be a, a no-brainer for the United States. Why is the administration forcing costly clean energy projects on our African partners that are not responsive to their needs and taking pragmatic approaches like natural gas um, off the table? Um, thank you. It will not shock you to hear that I need to reject the premise of, of the question because um, I think two aspects of it um, are at odds with what we find in the world. Uh, first, as it happens, we have an all of the above uh, approach uh, to electrification and to energy. Um, it is absolutely true that we want to lower emissions. We also uh, uh, recognize some of the deleterious uh, health effects of pollution that stems from, I, from I fossil fuels. If, if, if I could just finish and maybe make the second point because maybe more, well, but, more to your but point. But your, your is, point is wrong. Half of the $52 billion dollars is going to fossil fuels. So please explain that. Half of whose? Uh, 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 of I'm, I am telling you that the energy infrastructure grew by a factor of 10, and more than half of the $52 billion in energy loans issued by China's two main development right. finance institutions were allocated for fossil so fuels. I know you're talking specifically about Africa, so I would just, I don't know if you've seen the African Union's uh, strategy uh, on energy, which came out, which basically puts the pursuit of clean energy at the center of it, and that is in line with what we hear from our African partners all the time. Not for some ideological reason or because they're woke, but, but Why because is natural gas they want on the table? affordable energy and the prices of uh, solar and other uh, Why is clean natural energy gas off solutions. The table? It's not off the table. We, again, it's part of, I could come back to your staff and, and share with you some of the, the funding that we've done, particularly, as you know, to render other forms of energy more stable. Sometimes that's part of the solution. We like that because all they want is electricity and they're using it by they fossil fuels. They want electricity fuels. And, and in some instances, many of the instances, places we work, which are very remote areas, which don't have a chance of getting connected to the grid soon, a pop-up solar installation can be the let, only let me, hope let me move a community on, has Mr. of Pine. actually getting access to Let me move on. The administration has, has contributed $1 billion towards the Just Energy Transition Partnership. JETP in South Africa, which plans to tra transition to South African power grid towards clean energy solutions by paying owners to close their coal plants earlier than otherwise they than they otherwise would. Today, coal-fired power plants provide over 80 percent of South Africa's electricity, and with the current energy crisis plaguing the country, the South African people view the JETP very unfavorably. How do you respond to African governments? who view this administration's refusal to support any non-green energy projects as hypocritical. So as it happens, I attended President Biden's bilateral meeting with President Ramaphosa of South Africa, where he asked what we could do to accelerate the implementation of JTEP and, and where uh, additional resources could be provided to hasten the transition. So I, again, we're just, I guess, maybe hearing from, from different constituencies. 80% of South Africa's electricity is, is coal-fired. And they recognize the emissions effects, the health effects, and ultimately the need they to, don't to like begin to transition they don't like workers they don't to like other it forms one bit. of labor. Um, my my time has expired, but I very much need a, a, a meeting with you, ma'am, because I want to go over some of these, these specific... Um, I, as the chairman attested, I'm happy to give you my cell phone. We can talk later this That's evening. That's awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm very eager to dig into the details um, of these matters. I, I appreciate it, and uh, I yield back to the chair. Sounds like a date. <laughs> uh, Joel A. yields. <laughs> chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you sure that I'm in order for Al? I just didn't want to take anyone else's time. I just want to address, uh, thank you for being here, Administrator. Uh, I wanted to, am I right? <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Can we restart my time? Uh, I will reset the clock, and my apologies. No problem. Ms. Wilde is recognized. Thank you very much. Um, 
Administrator Power, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate your service and your time today. Um, last week, I led a letter to Speaker Johnson on the critical need to include humanitarian aid in any supplemental package that we consider in the House, aid for Gaza, as well as aid to other deeply vulnerable areas around the world. Um, first, let me just ask as a Preface, would you agree that humanitarian aid also functions as an investment in our own national security? Yes, because uh, I think as awful and messed up as so many uh, situations are right now for civilians, imagine people being taken off the rolls for being able to get a voucher or access to some small amount of food. Where do they go? Where do young men go? What are the other opportunities for them? And if I could just do one, I know you have many more questions, but the word supplemental when it comes to humanitarian assistance is a little bit of a misnomer. I agree. What, what would you prefer to see used? <laughs> uh, well, let me explain why it's a misnomer first, which is simply that our base humanitarian assistance were moved into the very generous Ukraine supplementals for the rest of the world. So when we, uh, what, what has happened is the supplementals have become the place where people have sought to put a large share of our humanitarian assistance. So if we don't get a supplemental, it's not just that we're not getting new money, supplemental money to deal with Sudan, a new war that happened between this year and last, or Gaza, which, which started on October 7th. It is that we are not even where we would have been. We'd be down a third from, from last year. Uh, Basically, we have 40% more needs okay. and 40% less I, I get your point. Resources. We need to rename yes. it. I agree with you, and I, I, I've, I've noted that problem. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to see um, the devastating impact of hunger, on, particularly on children, when I traveled to Kenya and saw USAID and the World Food Program in action. And I was especially impressed by the importance of, of these, ready-to-use therapeutic food. Um, acronym is RUDIF, which is not a particularly great acronym, but anyway. Um, and it says right on it, U.S. aid from the American people for children with severe acute malnutrition. And I learned amazing things about this little package, including that this provides enough caloric intake for a child for one day. Um, and I, I, my question to you is... Um, what needs to be done to ensure that these are more widely available? Now, granted, this is not a full, you know, a complete complement of nutrition and so forth, but it certainly helps a lot in curbing child hunger. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we launched uh, an unprecedented investment in RUTF uh, two years ago at the General Assembly and got other countries not only to match uh, the uh, several hundred million, the 200 million that we invested, uh, but to go beyond that. That has helped because supply chains, of course, depend on predictability and advance notice. So knowing there were going to be these big bulk orders has made it more readily available uh, because there were some bottlenecks in the supply. Can I stop you for one second? Do you, are these being used in Gaza? They are part of the WFP UNICEF uh, convoys and are getting in there, but we need to scale them given the degree of malnutrition. They're exact, I was actually, that was going to be my next point, is this is precisely what we need to reach those kids under five who have severe acute malnutrition now. And are, are there enough of these being made, or do we need to scale up the production of these? Well, it, it, everything unfortunately comes back a little bit to resources People aren't going to make them if they're not going to be purchased, so we need to mobilize more resources for humanitarian assistance generally, of which this is a critical subset. And I assume the distribution of them as well. Is that right? The distribution, I think we have the networks through WFP and UNICEF uh, to ensure that, again, if we have the resources to purchase them, if we have the resources to take care of them. Even well. in Gaza? Uh, oh, access is critical in Gaza. That's what I mean, yes, distribution. Be, I think okay. globally, yes. Okay. I'm going to really be quick on this last one. Um, I want to talk about the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 and specifically Section 620I, which provides that um, no foreign assistance will be provided to any country which prohibits or otherwise restricts the transport or delivery of hu United States humanitarian assistance. Are you aware of any U.S. provided humanitarian assistance that is being restricted by the Israeli government? Well, I think... 
President Biden's been clear that there have been significant restrictions that has Im have uh, impeded delivery, and we are trying to work those through and have made, again, accelerated progress in recent days. You know, customs restrictions, things that have left assistance, for example, flour sitting in a port that could be uh, in Gaza. So we are trying, again, uh, through our diplomatic uh, engagements and the kind of pressure that President Biden's been exerting for, for many months uh, to get uh, more assistance in. Do those rise to the levels of violations of 620I or not to that level? I, I'm, my understanding, this is something that Secretary Blinken is managing, and you'll have a chance, I'm sure, to engage him on, but uh, the National Security Memorandum 20 that was issued not long ago is taking 620I uh, in, and those, those uh, elements into consideration. I think that report is due out in early May. Thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Joe yields. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Kane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you to Administrator Power for being with us today. I'm going to start with a general question. Uh, investments in global health research and development not only help the United States develop innovative solutions to global health challenges across the world, but also invest dollars back into the American private sector and to research institutions alike. In New Jersey alone, over $1.5 billion has been invested into research institutions and nearly 20,000 new jobs have been created. What specific programs in global health generate R&D investments in U.S. Our, uh, industry and also in research institutions? Um, well, uh, I would just, since we're coming out not that long ago from COVID, you know, take note of the 700 million vaccines that were made here, purchased by the United States and given away for free, huge soft power in that, but also uh, that's American companies and workers are, are benefiting from that. Um, I think we we see, um, you know, I mean, I think about it, of course, from the standpoint of protecting, you know, the health and safety of Americans by investing in surveillance and, and labs uh, and the like. Um, but a lot of the research partnerships that the United States, that USAID has with American universities also are not only on, you know, seeds and, and agriculture related innovation, but also uh, in the health sector. And I'm happy to have Atul Gawande come and brief you on the specifics. If I'd, like. I'd appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, regarding uh, Ukraine, the United States has provided $22.9 billion direct budget to help Ukraine meet the emergency needs of its citizens. What kind of oversight procedures are in place to ensure that this assistance is not subject to waste, fraud, and abuse? Um, very extensive. Um, I, I, we started uh, very early on when this direct budget support began to flow, uh, which is provided only for verified expenditures uh, through the West Bank. So uh, those exp expenditures have to be verified before the money flows. It's not like you hand over a check for a billion dollars every month and, and it goes from there. Uh, but we brought Deloitte uh, on uh, uh, in order to do spot checks across the various ministries that were receiving these funds. The funds, of course, going to first responders, to teachers, uh, to uh, health workers and health services. Um, we have just done uh, a, a big open uh, source uh, co contract, it awarded a contract, I should say, uh, to KPMG to do an audit of all of the direct budget support. Uh, OIG has, our inspector general has significantly ramped up uh, the staff working on oversight specifically of direct if, budget support, including in Kiev. Have you, have you um, or excuse me, has USAID begun to implement OIG's recommendation calling for an action plan to verify the accuracy of expenditure reports for healthcare workers? Y yes, and thank you for mentioning that. Um, if you, notwithstanding the, the title of the report, actually in the report itself, it talks about the remedial steps that USAID has already taken to address what amounted to, uh, I don't want to call it clerical errors, but errors uh, in how we were actually verifying uh, or, or um, gaps, let me put it that way, in how we were doing the verification on salary specifically. But as soon as that was brought to our attention, it is something we smothered and addressed, which the report uh, testifies to. Okay. And um, all U.S. Uh, provided DBS to Ukraine has been in the form of grants. Correct. 
And why has USAID not structured its direct budget support to Ukraine as loans? I'd say two main reasons. One, uh, given Ukraine's budget challenges in light of Putin's aggression, um, the cost of a dollar of a loan is likely to be somewhere between 80 cents and a dollar, so the benefit for the but taxpayer. But if it was forgivable, for example. If, if, but, but would come, say that again? If it was forgivable. If it as, was. As, as other, you know, as many European Union nations, when they do their yes, direct budget, so then, well, it, they're, they're forgivable from the, from the, the very beginning. Correct, and and the way the Europeans have structured them again is you know almost low interest and and you know multi years into the future uh, payment recycles. But the second reason is that you know programs like the f nearly sixteen billion dollar IMF program are contingent on a certain amount of capital uh, and liquidity in Ukraine itself, uh, and that IMF investment which was very unusual for the IMF to operate in a war zone at that scale, was also t uh, presumed uh, the continuation, again, of, of the degree of liquidity that we and the Europeans and the Japanese and others have been able to provide. So I think there'd be significant shortcomings. Having said that, we, <laughs> we, we have to get direct budget support uh, to Ukraine. Our partners have front-loaded a lot of the assistance, still hoping that this vote is going to occur, still hoping that these resources are going to flow. Uh, and again, I think it's worth recalling, as you make this point so often, Putin is not only trying to take over Ukraine militarily, having failed to do that because of the courage of Ukrainians and the security assistance we've provided, he is trying to destroy the economy and the state. And uh, that state going bankrupt, uh, the morale consequences of having no teachers paid in schools or not being able to get health care uh, because of Putin's aggression, uh, the, the ripple effects of that and the gift to Putin uh, of, of depriving Ukraine of those resources, uh, it, it really can't be overstated. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. You know, yield. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Power, thank you for being here. Uh, as I know you know, the Ugandan Constitutional Court uh, has largely upheld the country's really draconian anti-homosexuality act, and they've allowed the criminalization of aggravated homosexuality punished by the death penalty. This is now to be the law of the land, and it's already resulted in a many, many human rights violations, including 184 evictions and 176 cases of torture. Unfortunately, this is kind of a current pattern that we're seeing, a larger trend uh, in abuse of LGBT rights. I, my bill, the GLOBE Act, would reaffirm U.S. position as a leader in championing human rights and would put sanctions or penalties on countries like Uganda that trample on those rights. I wonder if you could talk about how USAID works to prevent violence and human rights abuses like we're seeing in vulnerable communities like in Uganda, and speak about the importance of our USAID programs that respond to violence and stigma and discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's an extremely disturbing law and an extremely disappointing uh, court ruling. Um, let me just maybe just step for a second outside of your question and note uh, the deleterious health effects on the Ugandan population writ large by virtue of the passage of the Anti-Homosexuality Act. Um, it is not only LGBTQI plus individuals who are uh, afraid to come forward, for example, to, to receive their antiretrovirals, um, but it is also uh, people who aren't a member of that community for fear of being tagged and criminalized and potentially arrested uh, uh, by, by virtue of association, for example, with the PEPFAR program. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have seen uh, you know, a dramatic decrease in uptake of life-saving services uh, as a result of the passage of this law. We've also seen, and this is something you know, that also uh, happened because of a business warning put out uh, or business advisory put out by the State Department, uh, but you know, private sector investment, foreign direct investment, uh, in Uganda going down. Mm -hmm. uh, companies that might have been tempted to set up shop there, nervous about their employees and the fate of their employees. So while I haven't seen a good study showing the measurement, again, of the broader ripple effects, there's no question 
uh, that the law has done health harm and economic harm uh, to the people of Uganda, even outside that community. I think, you know, we are trying to be nimble, and our, our team on the ground has just done an incredible job um, uh, doing small grants, uh, but also PEPFAR, I, I really would applaud uh, for thinking through what this uh, uh, new penalty, as it were, for, for being part of the LGBTQI community or for seeking PEPFAR treatment means. Uh, so much more discrete forms of delivery uh, uh, for example, for medicines, uh, so so that people are able to get access to their medicines uh, in a manner that makes them feel safe. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, going to a, a kind of neutral mailbox, uh, a, a lockbox of, of, of a sort, rather than going into a PEPFAR clinic. So these are the kinds of accommodations we have to make in order to try to in, ensure as best we can that people keep seeking the support that they need in order to be able to live healthy, healthy lives, even as their dignity is trampled uh, by this law and its enforcement. Do you see this spreading as it seems to be in other countries and addressing it there in similar ways? I mean, certainly, as you know, there's pending legislation in a number of uh, African countries. Um, and there is, it is an issue that when times are tough economically or uh, governments feel under under pressure uh, or or public pressure because uh, they're not seen to be delivering. This is an issue that has tended to be demagogue. This is a community that has tended to be blamed, you know, through history, uh, but certainly in recent history. So uh, we worry about that a lot. We do a ton of diplomacy. We do a lot of contingency planning and programming, and we take the cue of the communities that are most vulnerable in terms of understanding how best to combine public and private diplomacy. So this is yet another front where you're out there uh, with this soft diplomacy and this real assistance and uh, helping it on all levels. Trying. Thank you. I'll yield back. Generally yields. Uh, Mr. Barr is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for holding the hearing and Administrator Power, thank you for your service. Um, and also thank you for your responsiveness with my constituent, Joe Montgomery, uh, in, uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, and his company, Square One Technology, um, who is seeking to provide uh, water purification systems in Kenya. Can you share USAID's goal for water purification in Africa and the benefits to US foreign policy to have US-made water purification systems provide this capability to countries across Africa? Um. Well, I can say that the Water for the World Act uh, is uh, celebrating uh, its anniversary this year, and we are uh, shifting to working with municipalities and utility companies at the center, so not just building pipes, but really looking at uh, standards, standards that then could lend themselves, for example, to the embrace of uh, US technology without weighing in on any particular firm, because we do open procurement and the like, uh, uh, and, and, and competitive uh, bidding processes and so forth. But, uh, but absolutely, as I was saying in my opening statement, when uh, we can secure regulatory changes on the ground, often it is done in a manner uh, that allows first movers, like those in the United States who have benefited from those technologies sooner, uh, to to uh, be able to take advantage uh, of those opportunities. So as we shift again to this emphasis on municipalities, reform and embrace of new technologies at the center, rather than just all the work out in the rural areas and so forth on uh, on piping and, and sanitation, uh, that should create opportunities along the lines of what you're describing. And I think in addition to the humanitarian uh, uh, pull of this uh, project, it's the, there's a strategic value in providing that soft power overture to places in Africa where Belt and Road is alive and well and where we uh, can counter uh, with, with USAID uh, efforts. Uh, Administrator Power, in March, uh, the UN Security Council embarrassed itself by passing a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza that was not directly tied to the release of innocent hostages currently uh, held by Hamas terrorists. Instead of providing the moral leadership and clarity the moment required by voting against that resolution, uh, the United States abstained. Uh, among the countries voting for a ceasefire, however, were several countries who receive 
U.S. assistance. Mozambique, who last year received uh, $469 million from USAID. Ecuador, who received $46.5 million from USAID. Sierra Leone, who last year received $29.5 million from USAID, to name a few. These are countries um, that will happily take money from the U.S. taxpayer and yet openly vote against our interests uh, in international bodies like the United Nations. How is USAID being strategic with its foreign assistance, ensuring that our assistance aligns with our strategic allies? Well, I think assistance decisions, um, uh, which are influenced heavily uh, by um, the strictures that come to us in our appropriations bills, regionally and sectorally, we are 90% earmarked uh, by sector, but that doesn't, uh, that, and there's significant earmarks by, by region, but your question is still very valid. I would just say there are a number uh, of factors, and I would take maybe the, the countries that you've mentioned. Sierra Leone, you know, this is a place that was nearly felled by the Ebola epidemic. Uh, a lot of the investments we have made in Sierra Leone are in the health sector uh, in order to give them better surveillance, lab capability, and the like. That, as we saw in the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, uh, uh, though. <laughs> Those investments are incredibly important to preventing something like that from happening again. We all remember the panic here in this country when our, we had our first Ebola case, which happened to be from Liberia. Mozambique, most of those investments are in the, the public health sector, again, on uh, TB, on global health security, on HIV. Um, and Ecuador, the narco trafficking collaboration that we are doing uh, you know, has great bearing as well for our own security. So. I'm only saying that there are factors, and it has to be a composite and, and, and assessment. And just reclaiming my time, and, Please, and, and you, you, you make you, you you answer the question persuasively, and you make the point about compartmentalization, and we're achieving objectives. But I am curious whether or not um, USAID coordinates with our UN ambassador uh, Thomas Greenfield in in using the the soft power of USAID to. Uh, provide a little additional leverage for our interests at the United Nations, because we're doing some very generous and positive things for these people, but they are, they, they are not demonstrating a reciprocal appreciation for that assistance on a strategic level, and I would like to see um, USAID uh, maybe exercise a little additional uh, muscle in that regard. I think it... Uh Certainly, having had the job that Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, has, uh, you know, there's probably no no better partnership between a UN ambassador and a USAID administrator than a former UN ambassador. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, she's done a, a very good job bringing that broader context to bear. At the same time, I will tell you, having had her job, we are also consistently going into other countries and asking them to do a whole set of things for us. And as it, we don't win every every one of these votes, and Israel in particular, is an area where there's a lot of voting divergence with some countries that we work with really well uh, on, on other issues. But when it comes to showing up against Russian aggression in Ukraine or to join a statement, you know, which is getting harder, but condemning the, the genocide against the Uyghurs in the, in the PRC, we, we, are, we are going back in again and again. And so, you know, I think to look at the broad voting convergence is something that I used to do when I was in her job, and I know she does every day, to see where is a country or how are they shifting? Is there a moment of opportunity where they're shifting more in our direction? And that's something we've actually seen with Ecuador uh, in, in over the course of the last uh, four or five years. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, response there. And, you know, not just with Israel, not just with Ukraine, but also Taiwan. So uh, yes. with that, and with that, I yield. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Jackson. Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership and your service. Honorable Mrs. Powers, and thank you for understanding that people that need food can also maintain their dignity and have their conscience and speak their mind. And I appreciate you not weaponizing the resource of food that we've been blessed with so abundantly that we do have friends. And in every family, we can have disagreements and we can come back together. So not weaponizing food is a major concern. I have a concern about the use of food right now in the Gaza Strip, and are you satisfied with the resources that we have that are going to stop starvation? This is a period of, of uh, indeed, of fasting that now has turned into famine. 
what are the political implications of us not getting food in there that can be unintended? Um, well, first, let me just say we need to pass the National Security Supplemental. Uh, recall that the 24 budget, which again presumes a National Security Supplemental, uh, does not have in it enough humanitarian assistance to keep us even close to flat. We'd be down 30 percent from where we were last year and needs and 50 percent from where we were two years ago because of the Ukraine supplementals providing that plus up for the rest of the world. So we need resources. But to your point, uh, I think President Biden has been really, really clear that uh, there have been too many restrictions, too many delays, uh, not enough points of access. You know, we, ha we, we did airdrops. We are doing airdrops. We are trying to build a maritime pier, but nobody thinks that those are solutions to reaching the food needs of more than 2 million people. We need sustained land access, including to the north, including through new checkpoints and crossing points. So a series of commitments, I will say, over the last few days have been made, but there's just not a minute to spare in seeing the implementation of those commitments. No, and that's no, Mrs. Powers, on. when have you last heard of airdrops being used to supply some uh, humanitarian food assistance? Well, I mean, humanitarians um, are food always... Food airdrops. Are, humanitarians are always very reluctant to use airdrops because uh, they are very imprecise. They don't come in in bulk. You know, our airdrops, for example, have meals ready to eat. They're a last resort. And they were needed in Gaza because of there was insufficient land access. Are there any other? Yeah, um, yes. I mean, we've had to use them in Deir el Zor, in Syria. I, I started my career in Bosnia, where they were used in, in uh, eastern Bosnia because of the Serb encirclement of, of Bosnian uh, towns. They, they are used, but. They're more expensive, less efficient, less, of course, scaled by definition than what we always need uh, and, and what people deserve, which is land access, sustained land access, not only to prevent famine, which of course we must do, that's a you know, five alarm fire, uh, but you mentioned in your, in your comments, I mean, to, to be able to live with some form of dignity, not you know, rushing against a, a convoy because you think it might be the last truck that ever comes to town with food for your kids. You know, that is not what we as humanitarians believe is, is a sound humanitarian approach. But for that to change, there have to, again, be more than just the Karim Shalom crossing, uh, but the Eretz crossing has to be opened. The, the hours have to be extended even more than they have. A corridor from Jordan is now being built. We yep. can get these numbers can way up. If I yeah. reclaiming my time, the um, Sudan crisis is something that's not giving much attention to, but I'd like to conclude with a crisis closer to home regarding Haiti. Uh, what is the condition of the, of the food conditions in Haiti, and what can we do about it? Well, I, again, um, you know, it's really important to get the, the security support police from Kenya deployed to Haiti because the biggest impediment to delivery in Haiti uh, is gang violence and is the you know, needs of humanitarians to be able to safely not only pass through particular neighborhoods, but also to be able to alert communities that the food is available and for those communities to know they can come and safely access those resources and the gangs have made that harder. So um, we are getting food and even fuel in and moving, um, but it is, nowhere near what it was, you know, six, even six months ago. And even then, I think we all would have said it is insufficient. And because the economy has shut down and so many businesses, for example, you know, even American companies that had worked in Haiti have had to pull out because of the insecurity, a, a larger and larger share of the Haitian people are now dependent on humanitarian assistance. But there's no answer without security and political transition as well. Well, I thank you very much for your generosity, your consistency. And I just find it hard to believe that the world's greatest military is being deterred and put in, in standoff in Haiti by a gentleman named Barbecue, a gang violence. And we have a military and they have gangs and we cannot penetrate. I yield back my time. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th Ambassador, great to see you again. Nice to see you. <clears throat> Just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thanks for underscoring <clears throat> the uh, Pardon me. <clears throat> that the PRC is the world's 
largest debt collector. Uh, I shared a hearing in this room just a couple of hours ago, and it was about the malign influence of China on the UN. And one of the things we pointed out in the hearing was that we provide $18 billion in 2022 uh, to the United Nations and its related agencies like WFP and others. Uh, and what did China do? <laughs> $2 billion. And it, I mean, it, when it comes to the voluntary, our, we have an assessment of $3 billion. $15 billion of that of the 18 is voluntary. Uh, and there seems to be a gross underappreciation of that uh, by people at the United Nations and elsewhere. So uh, that was brought forward in our, in our hearing this morning. But thank you for your point about the uh, uh, debt collector. Let me just ask you about the, the pause. Obviously, the, uh, to UNRAID, um, is that investigation still ongoing, especially in light of what has happened vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, uh, the appropriations bill, which precludes funding to UNRWA? Um, as you know, the State Department funds UNRWA, not USAID, although our partners work through UNRWA because they are the distribution system. Yes, I believe the two investigations you'd have to check with state, but are ongoing. One on the specific individuals and the 12 to 15 individuals against whom the Israelis presented these allegations. The second, the independent investigation from outside is on the policies and procedures around vetting such that uh, you know, allegations of this gravity, uh, you know, could, could could be possible or that individuals conceivably could work for UNRWA uh, and be perpetrating crimes like the horrors of October 7th. But both, both, to my understanding, are ongoing. But I know you will have some input, obviously, since so much of what you do humanitarian-wise. But I would ask you, um, in 2003, I offered an amendment to the Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations Act, passed the House, that the money should not go to UNRWA. We knew then uh, what a malign influence they were on children, child abuse, really, teaching Palestinian kids to hate Jewish people and Israel and the United States. Uh, and a, a bill that I have in this committee passed uh, uh, as well just a few weeks ago uh, doing the same thing. And, of course, the full House and Senate have joined in on that as well. Uh, so um, I, I would hope that the top-to-bottom look at UNRWA and the due diligence to ensure is that like-minded UNRWA types don't just get the money. And we find out that someone who used to work for UNRWA is now becoming the facilitator of that aid with the same basket of hate-filled anti-Semitism uh, that UNRWA has. I mean, I, you know, I think all organizations uh, uh, operating in, you know, such a complex uh, environment as Gaza, of course, are, are um, horrified uh, by, by what uh, appears to have emerged. And again, we'll await the, the findings. Um, but I do think it's important, and I don't know, uh, Congressman, if in your prior efforts to defund UNRWA any distinction was drawn, but, you know, you also have UNRWA operating in Jordan, and you have the King of Jordan, you know, making abundantly clear that at a time of great instability, when Jordan is a great partner to the United States, um, USAID has one of its biggest missions there, uh, but for Jordan to suddenly have to take over the schooling of two million uh, kids of Palestinian descent would be, you know, something that they are not capable of doing. And, um, you know, in Gaza as well, uh, the the work of those 13,000, hum, you know, humanitarians who are teachers, who are health workers, you know, you, you know well, because you've been in, in so many of these countries, we don't have an NGO out there or another. This is not your traditional UN agency where you can have, like, schools in a box, you know, teachers in a box, health workers in a box. They were almost like a, there was Hamas was the state and Hamas won the election back in the day and Hamas you know obviously had had far too much influence uh, on certain individuals or, or even certain individuals were, were it seems like potentially part of Hamas but but the fact is the administration of schools and health systems was UNRWA and it's and there's not an NGO or another UN agency that could perform the, the function of a state like that, or at least I haven't encountered one in my years of humanitarian service. I would hope that every effort would be made to do so. Uh, let me ask you finally, you know, there's been a great deal of concern about PEPFAR and what the administration did to integrate uh, promoting abortion. I mean, I sat right here a couple of uh, seats away when Henry Hyde led the effort in 2003 to enact PEPFAR. Uh, a tremendous bill. I did the reauthorization of it uh, the last time for five years. But we had protections, pro-life protections, to ensure that it stayed on point on trying to mitigate and end the pandemic of, of, um, of um, HIV AIDS. Uh, 
can you assure us that the NGOs that are getting the money, especially pursuant to the guidance that has been given to them uh, by the administration, I have a copy of the guidance, as well as reimagining PEPFAR, uh, that they're not promoting abortion? You know, what I can assure you of is that USAID follows the law. PEPFAR follows the law. USAID does not fund abortions. PEPFAR has saved 25 million lives. I know that. And I'm, but, but the amount of misinformation about PEPFAR money is that NGOs. is being propagated is with, so unfair to the people who have saved those lives that you have well, seen in the field I've working. I've been out in the field. But the problem is that we, that we have given them a dual mission to bring down pro-life laws. It's right in the guidance that, was, that has been that tendered to all the... It's right there in black and white. I'll put it in the record. Thank you. I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Power, for being here and for all of your work and what I know is a incredibly difficult uh, global challenges right now. Um, I first wanted to, to ask you about your localization agenda that I was so excited when you announced. Uh, I was really proud that this committee uh, last month passed my Locally Led Development and Humanitarian Response Act on a bipartisan basis, which would institutionalize reforms that would make it easier for USAID to work with local partners. Can you discuss how this bill would enable USAID to work more with local organizations? Um, well, thank you. I sometimes feel like you know more about localization than I do, so I feel like I should uh, defer. Uh, but this has been a huge priority. As you know, we're making these giant investments. We do not want our investments um, and the good that they do to end when large international organizations or contracting partners depart or when a contract or a grant uh, expires. So I think accessibility is one of the things that your bill has emphasized, uh, you know, translating requests for proposals into multiple languages. I think, you know, artificial intelligence and, and chat GPT, you know, are, are, are going to make it, it more easy for local organizations to understand what we're looking for and to, and to respond. Uh, raising the de minimis rate uh, for assistance to 15% would mean that these small organizations who don't have the big accounting firms and the lawyers, you know, to compete for our assistance um, get some overhead and, you know, have the ability uh, as well to invest in their own capacity. And then we're still working on SAM registration, which you have emphasized as well, making that easier. You know, I've been in a situation where a war breaks out or Putin does something horrible, <laughs> um, and we see a local organization that we would love to work with, but the barriers to entry through the SAM process uh, are, are just uh, too high. And then lastly, what I, I also incredibly grateful for uh, potentially allowing the restriction of competition to local organizations for acquisition. Um, we can already do that for assistance, but to extend that to acquisition is really important. So grateful for all. Thank you. Um, I, I now want to turn to the dire situation in Sudan. I just returned from the Chad-Sudanese border, uh, where I heard directly from Sudanese refugees about the terrible situation that they are fleeing. Um, you know, April 15th will be one year since the war started. We've seen 25 million people need aid. Tens of millions of people have been forced from their homes. Without the supplemental passing, uh, U.S. humanitarian assistance faces a 40% cut, and uh, we heard that the World Food Program may be unable to serve any Sudanese refugees in Chad starting this month. Can you discuss um, the challenges to humanitarian funding and access in Sudan right now and what no supplemental would mean for the Sudanese people? Um, well, last year, thanks to the generosity of people here and the taxpayer, um, we were able, we USAID were able to provide $600 million in funding, which is, you know, I'm really proud that we were able to do that, but also horrified that a country uh, that is entirely capable of feeding itself and, and, and a population that's immensely uh, educated and dynamic, you know, is stuck because of these two uh, fighters, uh, you know, military men who decided uh, to put their own uh, lust for power above the welfare of their people. The U.S. government as a whole gave close to a billion dollars and, and invested that in just keeping people alive. You know, this is not, um, this is no way to live, let me put it that way. But even with those resources, both Hekmeti uh, and uh, General Burhan have imposed uh, abominable restrictions on our humanitarian aid partners. I mean, whether it's, you know, delaying visas or, 
you know, having these long convoys of resources where there are starving people, you know, just up ahead and refusing to allow those convoys uh, to pass. Um, you know, this is something, again, that we raise again and again. Special Envoy Periello now is taking up this charge uh, full time uh, and engaging with both parties. There's been, again, modest uh, uh, progress in, in, in getting at least some access. But to lose the supplemental means falling off a cliff. And if Periello, if the UN new UN uh, special envoy are able to press and secure access. How tragic would it be that we finally get the access we need uh, and then don't have the resources to actually fund WFP or UNICEF? Absolutely. And just in my remaining time, I, I just want to say, you know, I know uh, Ms. Wild asked you about 620I. My reading of the National Security Memorandum 20 is that it actually has a different standard. The standard is that uh, not only does our partner country have to not uh, inhibit aid, but actually has to facilitate and not arbitrarily deny uh, the delivery of any U.S. supported international efforts to provide humanitarian assistance. Would you say that given your experience right now that Israel is in compliance in facilitating the delivery of U.S. supported international efforts to provide humanitarian assistance? Um, well, first I would say that I think 620I is covered by the higher standard in the National Security Memorandum. So I think that's what is meant. And um, again, the Secretary is managing that process. USAID has provided input on that question, um, but uh, we will have to w await the report in early May. A number of commitments have been made. They need to be implemented with haste. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Administrator. I appreciate, I'm so grateful uh, for your service. I always, one of the highlights of my service uh, is going around the world to see USAID programs successful. Uh, one that I just will never forget uh, in a very rural area of Afghanistan to see a sign with the clasped hands of the flag of uh, Afghanistan and the United States. And it was a rusty sign uh, indicating the location of a school that had been built. And the rusty sign indicated to me that anybody could have taken it down any time, but they didn't. They were appreciative of what was done one-on-one uh, -on -one to help people. And then in the Middle East, I'm so grateful for uh, your immediate uh, aid to the people of Turkey uh, with the recent uh, earthquake in southeastern Turkey with the uh, critical facilities at Insulik. Uh, Americans acted immediately with uh, your leadership to provide assistance to the victims uh, and we so appreciate uh, this vital NATO ally. We so appreciate the democracy of Turkey. We are all celebrating 100 years of uh, Turkish democracy and 75 years of NATO membership. Turkey is a shining beacon of hope for the, and success for the region. And recently, I visited in uh, August uh, Ankara and Istanbul and uh, the advances of the Turkish people with a very vibrant uh, and uh, very... Um, uh, appreciated uh, Turkish American community is so meaningful. And so thank you for what you've done uh, uh, for the people of Turkey. Additionally, uh, I'm, I am concerned uh, in uh, the, uh, the opposite, the dictatorship of Assad uh, in Syria. Uh, the White Helmets are one of the best and only volunteer civilian humanitarian organizations operating in the non-Assad regime areas. Every day, they respond to assaults on villages and civilian infrastructure by the Assad regime and uh, its puppet master, the regime of the war criminal Putin. They provide life-saving medical aid to children with horrific wounds and operate in the absolute worst of conditions. Following the catastrophic earthquake, again, the earthquake that uh, struck both Syria and Turkey, uh, the White Helmets immediately mobilized and were able to save hundreds of lives. I'm, it's really sad that it's come to my attention. There are cuts proposed in the already modest budget from $7 million to $3 million for FY25. Uh, what, uh, can, uh, we've asked for a clarification. What is uh, the commitment? What will be done? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of the White Helmets uh, and have been uh, since they first came to my attention, I think back in, in 2012 probably was the first time uh, uh, I learned of their unbelievable bravery. Uh, they then became the target of mass Putin misinformation uh, uh, in a way that you know affected my work at the UN uh, because we had to spend a lot of time truth telling about what the White Helmets actually did. Um, and it's been a great source of pride for me at USAID. In fact, after the earthquake, 
uh, to make one of our first grants uh, because of the exchange I just had with Congresswoman Jacobs, you might understand that giving a grant to a local organization is quite hard because USAID is sort of hard to work with. We have a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of compliance requests, but we were able to speed the paperwork and get resources out the door. I will look at the cut. It may just be that that is part, because you're bringing that to my attention, that that is part of the broader cut because our assistance is down, our humanitarian assistance is down 40% and needs are up 40%. So though that just may be part of the, the overall cut across the board. Uh, well, Administrator, I'm so grateful you know who they are. Uh, mm -hmm. You know how significant it is. And uh, gosh, the uh, helping the people of Syria help the people of Turkey too uh, with the uh, cross-border uh, earthquake. And it just would be so helpful uh, to have uh, funding sufficient for their actions to resist uh, war criminal Putin and the dictatorship, murderous dictatorship of Assad. Another uh, issue we have uh, with UNRWA, uh, in light of the UNRWA employees uh, involved, cl clearly by video uh, uh, on October 7th, uh, I'm grateful that there has been an effort to block uh, funding to them. What is USAID doing to increase your own capacity to provide uh, humanitarian uh, aid to Gaza, but not relying on the UN? Um. Well, there's UNRWA, and then there's the rest of the UN family. As it happens, it's the State Department that, that funds UNRWA, but our main partners are organizations like the World Food Program, which is also a UN agency, UNICEF, Save the Children, Medical, uh, International Medical Corps, um, the distribution network, the trucks, uh, the workers who are there in mass. And, and my time is up, but I do want to congratulate. From, uh, you're working with the World Food Program, formerly uh, led by Nobel laureate, former governor of South Carolina, David Beasley. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, sir. I recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Administrator Power, and heartfelt gratitude uh, to you, to everybody at USAID for what you do, how you do it, uh, the importance to humanity, and also to building uh, the American brand, which I think you do uh, beautifully. Uh, I want to uh, support so many of my colleagues' contention that we must pass the Senate supplemental bill with $10 billion for emergency aid. And along with our chairman, Mr. Wilson, who's leaving, I'm the ranking member of the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and Central Asia subcommittee, so I'm going to direct a few questions about that region uh, to you, starting with Lebanon. Uh, the World Bank, of course, has described the circumstances there as uh, some of the worst since the mid-19th century. Uh, the uh, currency has been devalued 98 percent. Lebanese people have about four hours of electricity per day. A million Lebanese children uh, do not have access to quality education. And of course, there are about a million and a half Syrian refugees, putting a lot of strain on the very few services available in Lebanon. Uh, the Economic Support Fund request includes, of course, a targeted increase for Lebanon, uh, but I'd welcome some perspective from you on what you're seeing there and the role of USAID uh, in supporting the Lebanese and Syrian refugees. Well, just in brief, I'm sure you have other questions, but, um, you know, we can't, in answering this question a year ago, we would talk about many of the same conditions that you described, but we now have on top of it the really uh, significant escalation uh, in clashes between uh, Lebanon and, and Israel, and fairly significant displacement within additional displacement within Lebanon uh, of Lebanese, some people being displaced uh, for a second or third time. So um, again, <laughs> we need the supplemental because we need the humanitarian resources to be able to fund the organizations and the, and the trusted partners who would go out and meet humanitarian needs. Um, but stepping back to the more evergreen issue of Lebanese politics, we also need, <laughs> uh, you know, government okay. formation um, and stable transition and, uh, you know, the, the private sector and others to be able to know that Lebanon's governance and its rule of law uh, are sound. And so that is where, in addition to, you know, providing tactical economic counsel uh, at a time of uh, relative economic unraveling for the economy, um, we are also, as a government as a whole, you know, really pushing for the tough political decisions that haven't been made in, in really now quite some number of years. Can, can you speak to anything USAID is doing right now on the ground? Uh, I mean, providing humanitarian assistance to the newly displaced, of whom I think there are more than uh, close to 200,000 people who've been displaced, 
Um, we're doing a lot on electrification. As you know, power, you drive through Lebanon now. And a few it's, hours a day. It's, yeah. So, um, you know, when I visited recently, we were, uh, you know, working with local communities uh, and private investors to stand up solar off-grid in the Becca Valley and elsewhere because there are parts that have not been connected with the grid. That, in turn, is beneficial both to the Lebanese host communities but also to the Syrian refugees. So for them to see, the Lebanese host communities to see some benefit um, accruing or more international attention being uh, lent uh, when they've opened their homes and, and the strain uh, of the demands on their infrastructure uh, are certainly showing. So those are some examples. But um, but again, uh, the, the political uh, and the economic and the security all go together, three legs of the triangle. Okay, and moving to another challenge, Tunisia. I know President Saeed is overseeing backsliding and erosion of civil, civil society. And I know we're limiting our direct bilateral support, but I uh, would welcome your perspective also, also on Tunisia, uh, what role you are playing right now and what we should be and can be doing. Well, I mean, it goes without saying that the checks and balances, um, notwithstanding the effort to centralize power and to, to chill speech and dissent, uh, our support for those players who are still uh, out there bravely standing up for the Tunisian democracy that they dreamed of um, and worked so hard to, to try to, to put in place, uh, that support is really important. Um, you know, just stepping back, though, I will say that cuts across the board to our development assistance in the 24 bill, cuts that are, you know, going to be to our development assistance account roughly 10%, mm -hmm. are going to take a toll on even that vital democracy rights and governance uh, support. So at just the time that we see democratic backsliding, we want to be in a position to surge support for those who are contesting it. Instead, uh, that is going to become more challenging because of the cuts. Okay, well, I'm running out of time. I was going to ask you also about uh, the Syrian camps, Al Hol and Roja, but um, I think I'm out of time, unfortunately. So, thank you. thank you. I yield back. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Chairman. Ambassador, good to see you again. Uh, why is it you take the toughest job there is? At the, at the worst possible time, and you arrive here seeming like, you know, I'm just getting started, I've got the energy, we're gonna do this. Um, you're, you're the only person I know that comes before a committee like this with a positive attitude and leaves with a positive attitude, and I wanna commend you for that because the questions are inherently tough, and mine will probably be no exception. It was touched on earlier. Uh, even though UNRWA wasn't our direct authority and certainly wasn't yours, Congress on a bipartisan basis now has essentially said we cannot trust the UN, specifically UNRWA, in Gaza. That means that by definition, many of the same people who worked for UNRWA will need to be rehired by some successor organization. Others will need to be recruited. With your vast experience both at the UN and now at USAID, how would we go about ensuring that, th that we vet people in a very different way, we vet programs in a different way, and at some time, God willing, in the near future, we be begin rebuilding Gaza for the, the Palestinians, the 1.2 plus million, who will hopefully be returning to what will become homes again. That's probably the largest job, perhaps since World War II, to look at an area so dense and have to rebuild. One, is your organization up to being a partner in that? And if not, who? I mean, this is a very challenging question. Let me just say in the, in the here and now, um, there is no substitute for the humanitarian backbone that they provide. Just the sheer numbers of individuals, the experience they have, their knowledge of communities, Again, where the trucks come from, who knows the routes, and just, and I'll get to your question, but one little parenthetical is Israel, about a month ago, uh, in light of the allegations, the horrific allegations, uh, ma made a decision that UNRWA could not participate in convoys uh, uh, to the north, humanitarian convoys. Um, but what that meant was, fundamentally, there could be no convoys to the north, because you can't as bombs are falling and kinetic operations are underway and terrorists are being pursued, you, you can't, you know, suddenly 
invent an entire humanitarian infrastructure, which I know is not what no. you're suggesting. No, no, Ambassador, yeah. just to narrow it for sake yeah. of time. Okay. After World War II, both in Europe and in Japan, we recognize that you come as you are and use what is available. That includes the people who know these routes, the people who uh, were teachers, the people who provided humanitarian aid. I don't have any illusion that suddenly we're going to find thousands of replacement people. My question really was, how do we vet? How do we participate in a vetting that can cause the people of Israel, the people of the United States as taxpayers, and, and Congress and yourself to have comfort that what happened, what has been discovered under the, the grounds of Gaza uh, won't happen again? Uh, I have no illusions. Many of those people uh, may not love Israel, but they would, they do care about their people or foreigners who cared about people. So um, I'm not saying that, and maybe others here on the dais would say it, I'm not saying that, the, that you're disqualified if you work for UNRWA. I'm saying that at the top, there has to be new confidence. You, uh, you're too young, but I'm not to remember when the Red Cross had no confidence and we brought in Elizabeth Dole. She didn't fire everybody, but she did begin rebuilding confidence in that great organization. How do we re rebuild the confidence to take care of the worst humanitarian disaster in modern times? Um, well, despite whatever energy I might have, positive energy, I hope, uh, fundamentally, this is not something that I have dug into personally, but the second... You're just one phone call away from the president giving you this job. You know that. <laughs> uh, but the second investigation underway, there's one into the named individuals that the Israelis brought forward uh, who are alleged to have been complicit in or particip actively participated in October 7. The other investigation is on this question, on the policies and the procedures and the vetting. And that's for UNRWA itself. But I would presume that whatever lessons are gleaned about UNRWA would be the ones that would be applied as well to other organizations who, of course, the organizational leadership are all worried, uh, you know, uh, that, that, you know, allegations like that could be brought forward. But their, their presence, again, in Gaza is so small that their ability to take, which I know, again, is not what you're suggesting, but to take up what UNRWA has been doing in wartime uh, is not present. I will say also, last point, is that other donors are going to make a huge difference here. We are following the law, the Biden administration. Uh, you know, we think it's really important to con for UNRWA to continue to do uh, its vital work, particularly in places like Jordan and elsewhere in the region, but also in Gaza where the needs are so great. Um, but that we are going to follow the law, and that, and that is not going to be possible for the U.S. to fund. Other countries are stepping up and doing more to sustain UNRWA. Um, and, you know, I think we want to make sure that they are also using their leverage on behalf of UNRWA reform if UNRWA ends up, uh, you know, being the organization of choice for the rest of the world uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for being here. I want to thank you for the work you do. Uh, you know, broadly, I say the world's safer and U.S. interests are better served, advanced, and protected when America leads and we work with our allies and partners. And I've often talked about in this room the, the three-legged stool of defense, diplomacy, and development, and how the three need to work together, and USAID is certainly a, a critical component of that. You know, the agency is unparalleled in its ability to help counter the root causes of extremism, uncontrolled migration, and international crime caused by poverty and home, hopelessness. USAID cultivates freedom, democracy, stability, three crucial components of an effective American-led international order. And so, again, thank you for what you do, but for all these reasons, it's also why I'm disheartened by voices shying away from our responsibility to lead. Uh, for example, fiscal year, fiscal year 24 appropriations already included counterproductive uh, cuts to uh, USAID's budget. And I pray, I hope, that my Republican colleagues won't do the same in 2025, and I just want to start with that. Uh, let me shift, though, and, and talk about Gaza. We've already talked quite a bit about it. You know, three key things that I, I, I see. We need to immediately uh, surge massive quantities of humanitarian aid, in particular food, into Gaza. We know that. But we need to be able to sustain those uh, quantities of, of aid over time. And ultimately, we need to break with recent history and work to create a new vision for Gaza, 
a new, better future for both Palestinians, Israelis, and, and everyone uh, around the region. So I've got a number of questions, but I'll start with, you know, it, the, from the beginning of this war, uh, Hamas started on October 7th. I've been doing all I can to convince Egypt and Israel to open border crossings for aid. First Rafah, then Karim Shalom, and, and, and now Erez. Can you talk about how aid is getting across the border and how it is or is not being distributed once it's across the border throughout Gaza? Well, in brief, of course, um, uh, inspections uh, in Nitsana and in Karim Shalom. I also visited uh, last month uh, to see the, the process in Karim Shalom. Um, and, you know, it is really important that just in the last week you've seen the number of hours uh, that the inspections are able to occur uh, expanded. Uh, this is something President Biden has been pushing for for, you know, almost the full six months of, of the war. Um, so those, you know, again, expanding the throughput of inspections is how we have been able to get up now to, I think, 420 trucks yesterday, which is double where we were a week ago. Right. Um, so that's one answer. Also, moving supplies from Jordan um, in Al-Arish, as you probably saw. How about saw. Within, once it's in Gaza? Oh, how sorry, is it getting to the, the distribution in Gaza. I think their, um, <laughs> you know, scarcity of flow in created a much more challenging situation on the other side because the prices went up, the gangs were incentivized, the civilians grew desperate, and movement became very challenging. We are hopeful, and, and the government of Israel uses this expression now too, that flooding the zone with food will render uh, you know, access uh, more secure and more stable, but Israel has to be a part of that too. Sure. The number of convoys turned back at checkpoints or have to wait for hours, which is itself a security hazard for those driving those convoys, that has to change. And so that's part of the deconfliction and, and coordination process we're a part of. Great, thank you. Do you have a, a sense of how much of the aid that's actually gotten into Gaza across the border has either been stolen by Hamas and taken down in the tunnels or commandeered by the gangs and, and put on the blank black market where civilians are having to pay for the, that aid? I mean, what I can say is that our partners in order to receive U.S. aid funding are all obliged to report diversion, and we are not seeing uh, Hamas dictating where uh, food is provided. I can assure you that if the government of Israel saw Hamas doing that, just as they brought forward the UNRWA allegations, we would be hearing about it. Um, so, you know, it's not a, a perfect distribution network, and as I mentioned, the the famine-like conditions in the north and the near famine-like conditions in much of the south create a level of des desperation that has led to what is referred to as self-distribution. But what that appears to have done is now pave the way for, or, or at least this is the hope, is that that will pave the way for much more the, of the traditional um, uh, humanitarian distributions that we see in other war settings. It was having so little food getting in for so long, it created an almost Hobbesian dynamic that went well beyond uh, Hamas, uh, which again, we have not seen that systematic diversion or even the reports that our partners are required uh, to, to provide. If it, Thank if you. And I'm out of time. I'll leave the last question uh, maybe for, for the record. But uh, what can Congress do? What are the most important things we can do to make sure that that aid gets into Gaza, that the needed, the needs of the Gazan people are addressed? You can know, I answer quickly? Yeah. Pass the supplemental and and press uh, our Israeli partners to actually follow through on the commitments that they've made uh, in recent days, but follow through with haste, recognizing that it's a famine that we're talking about. This Happy is not something it. that can wait. Happy to do it. With that, I yield back. I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Self. How are you doing today? Good. So I've heard a lot of different back and forth, both from your opening statement and response to questions. Did the Biden administration cut off aid to Gaza or not? Did the Biden administration cut off aid to Gaza? U.S. aid to Gaza. No. No. Did the Biden administration cut off U.S. support to UNRWA? We suspended support to UNRWA when the allegations came forward, so put a pause on it, yes. Is that support still suspended? I, again, I don't administer UNRWA support, but yes, I mean, we're now under, it's, we, we have the provisions of the, of the 
FY24 bill, which I think prohibits UNRWA funding. Again, this is run out of the UNRWA funding questions, I think should be referred to the State Department. So we did not suspend aid to Gaza. We did suspend support to UNRWA? Uh, correct, when the allegations came forward. And it's still suspended today? To my knowledge, yes. Okay, and why was it important that we suspended aid to UNRWA? Because these were very serious allegations uh, and that we and many of our Democratic friends believe the UN had to launch a credible and independent investigation into. And those investigations, again, two of them, one outside the UN system, one within it, uh, within the Office of Investigations or whatever, uh, are, are currently underway. And what do you know about the outcomes of those allegations? I don't know about the outcomes of the investigations. Do you think it's important that we suspend aid to UNRWA? I think it's important that the perpetrators of crimes be held accountable. I think it's important that people who would participate in a terrorist attack uh, and who want to eliminate the Jewish people and the state of Israel uh, not, not work uh, for a humanitarian agency. I think it's also important that there not be famine uh, in Gaza and that innocent civilians not pay the price uh, for the crimes of a few. So you don't think that we should be suspending aid to Gaza? I think we should be uh, supporting a humanitarian operation that has as its backbone UNRWA. You think we should be giving U.S. aid to Gaza? We are giving U.S. aid to Gaza, and I think we should, yes. And you think we, that, that we should do that? Yes, I, I think it's not in our um, consistent with our values or our interests to see people starve in Gaza. But and so think I think we should be part of the solution and not the problem, yeah. Plainly, you know, again, you just, to, to repeat it, to not be convoluted here, you think that we should give U.S. dollars, U.S. aid, U.S. support to Gaza? To the people of Gaza. USAID gives support to World Food Program, to UNICEF, to International Medical Corps, to our trusted partners that we work with all over the world. Those are the individuals and the organizations to whom we are giving resources. And we are doing so because we believe that they should, yes, be providing, for example, ready to use therapeutic food to kids under five whose arms are about this big at this point because of lack of access to food and nutrition. Yeah, I think we should support trying to undo a situation where kids are dying when there's food on the shelves in supermarkets just a few kilometers away. Are Palestinians our ally? We, we have an interest and we have a long history of working with the Palestinian people um, and we should continue to do so. Is Israel our ally? Yes. Are Palestinians our ally? Pal the Palestinians are our, our partners and our friends. As you know, ally is a term of art that is Palestinians used are our friends. Many Palestinians are our friends, absolutely. The, their government is our friend? I, I, we, we work with the people of, uh, we work with communities. We work with people who are holding the Palestinian Authority to account, independent journalists, civil society organizations, who are documenting many of the things that I'm sure you are uh, rightly publicizing. So checks and balances are incredibly important, but if we think we can see uh, a secure and democratic and thriving Israel without looking out as well for the welfare of the Palestinians and ensuring that they can live in dignity and security side by side, I think that's very short-sighted. Do you think Egypt should be taking in Palestinians? I, th I mean, it's, I, I think that, wait, what is the context in which you're asking that question? You, you mean? Quite obviously in front of you, the, the un, ongoing war. Do you think Egypt should be taking in Palestinians? Egypt is taking in medical evacuations of Palestinians uh, fr from Gaza, and we're working with our partners on the ground. open the door and let anybody come in that wants to? You know, I think fundamentally what you have among Palestinians uh, is a desire to live in their homes, homes they've lived Not in an for, for Do generations. Do you think Egypt should open the gates and say, come on in? I, I, I think that it is important that Palestinians who live in Gaza can remain in Gaza, which is where they want to remain. My time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you. Administrator Power, thank you for joining us today. And of course, I'd normally ask you about locally led development and some of your great work there at UCID, but I want to ask you, obviously, about the very urgent situation, humanitarian situation in Gaza. In your testimony, you said that the entire population of Gaza is living under the threat of famine. 
uh, news reports came out recently that certain USAID officials sent a cable to the National Security Council warning that famine is already likely occurring in parts of the Gaza Strip. According to the report, quote, famine conditions are most severe and widespread in northern Gaza, which is under Israeli control. Uh, do you think that it's plausible or likely that parts of Gaza, and particularly northern Gaza, are already experiencing famine? Well, the methodology that the IPC used is one that we had our experts scrub. It's one that's relied upon in other settings, and that is their assessment, and, and we believe that assessment is credible. Uh, so there's famine is already occurring there? That is, yeah. yes. Okay. And more than half of the population of Gaza is under the age of 18, as you know, and are seriously affected by the lack of access to food and nutrition. And various organizations, including the United Nations, have warned that hundreds of thousands of Palestinian children may die if they don't get necessary food and nutrition assistance in just the next two to three weeks. Uh, has USAID made such an assessment itself? And do you have a sense of how many such children might be at risk of dying if they don't get access to food and nutrition that's currently unavailable? Um, I do not have those assessments on hand, um, but I will say that the in northern Gaza, the rate of malnutrition prior to October 7th uh, was almost zero, and it is now one in three, uh, one in three kids. Um, but uh, extrapolating out is hard. And I, I will say just with some humility, because it is so hard to move around in Gaza, because the access challenges that give rise in part to the malnutrition are so severe, um, it is also you know, hard to do the kind of scaled assessments that we would, we would wish to do. But in terms of uh, you know, actual severe acute malnutrition for under fives, that rate was 16% in January and became 30% in February. And we're awaiting the, the March numbers, but we expect it to So it got markedly that. worse. Yeah, mar markedly worse, but extrapolating and giving you the overall numbers. And just to be clear, I realize you're not part of the DOD or, or you know, the State Department in working on these issues diplomatically, um, but is it your understanding that humanitarian assistance and food assistance is not supposed to be denied even when countries are at war with each other? Because there is this argument that, well, if, if Hamas would release the hostages, if they would surrender, that this would stop. But there's certain laws of war and certain conduct that nations are supposed to follow, uh, and that includes allowing for humanitarian assistance. Correct. I mean, I will say, of course, and we all agree, the hostages should be released. Absolutely. It's an absolute outrage that they have been kept this long and the, and the horror and terror for their fam the families of those individuals. I can't even contemplate, but yes, food must flow. But and kids not can't be starved because you have two groups that are at war with each other. Food must flow, and food has not uh, flowed in sufficient quantities uh, to avoid this imminent famine in the south and, and these conditions that are giving rise already to child deaths in the north. And I'm down to one minute, so part of this maybe we'll ask for the record, but uh, in response to questions from my colleague, uh, Representative Wild of Pennsylvania, you said that there have been restrictions on U.S. humanitarian assistance. Uh, you also referenced the National Security Memorandum 20 as taking into account future restrictions, and you said that that was a process that Secretary Blinken uh, was leading. Given USAID, USAID's expertise on these issues, was USAID, and in particular the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, provided an opportunity to weigh in to the State Department's determination under NSM 20 that Israel's assurances that is following U.S. and international law are, quote, credible and reliable. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your work. And I yield back. I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. War is a horrible thing, and dealing with humanitarian aid during the fog of war and the stresses that go with that, I, I just... I admire your efforts in that regard. I know that's a difficult thing, especially in a politically charged environment, to add to that. Uh, with that said, some interesting things came up that I kind of want to clarify with some statements you've made in the past. Uh, the Washington Post reported that in January of this year, while you were giving a speech on climate change, 
A former employee of USAID interrupted you regarding the current conflict of Israel in Israel, saying, you wrote a book on genocide, you were still working for the administration, you should resign and speak out, end quote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert this Washington Post article on, titled U.S. AIDS, Samantha Power, Genocide Scholars Confronted by Staff on Gaza. Gaza, to the record, please. Without objection. Thank you. According to the same article, you thanked her for her comments and stated that more than 25,000 civilians have been killed in the conflict. That number came from the Gaza Ministry of Health, which Hamas, uh, Hamas controls. Uh, did you agree with the heckler's premise that the Israel's fight against Hamas constitutes genocide? Yes or no? I think every country has a right to defend itself, uh, and uh, Israel certainly has a right to uh, defend itself. Hamas still uh, seeks to eliminate Israelis. I just visited Kibbutz Berry, where 100 people, more than 100 people, were killed uh, on October 7th. Uh, so uh, I think that that uh, right to pursue Hamas is clear. I also think pursuing Hamas in a manner that looks out for civilians, that where they provide humanitarian access in, in, in sufficient amounts is imperative So, so well. do you believe, I'm going to restate the question just to make sure I understand, do you believe the way that Israel's fighting against Hamas, does that constitute genocide, yes or no? Again, I'm not going to answer yes or no questions like that. I'm going to do my job, which is focusing on getting humanitarian assistance okay. to people who need it. Fair enough. Obviously, uh, the person who confronted you is not the only USAID employee who thinks this way. In November, hundreds of your employees signed a letter calling for a ceasefire. And I was in Afghanistan, and I realized the, USM, uh, the USMC, which uh, governs military actions, is a little bit different than everybody else. Um, but, for example, I couldn't, as a military non-combatant, an ER physician in Afghanistan, it would probably be inappropriate for me to write a letter to the president saying, I think we should have a ceasefire in Afghanistan, to say the least. Uh, do you think it's appropriate for USAID uh, workers to do this same kind of thing where they, they basically sign letters stating an opinion rather than doing their job, basically staying, uh, taking a political stance? I mean, I have no evidence that they're not doing their jobs, we, as you noted. So it is appropriate. 75 crisis. Not whether it's, we have a dissent channel, we have a direct channel for a reason. I benefit from hearing from staff. I get criticized all the time. Uh, sometimes I think the criticisms are valid, uh, and sometimes I, I learn something about how what I'm doing is perceived or how what the Biden administration is doing is perceived. And I would note that, again, we've had internal traffic, maybe not of that magnitude, but also on Afghanistan. Uh, I, I got to move quickly because I only have a minute and a half left, sorry. so I appreciate your candor on that. There's an article last month titled Top Biden Advisor Reveals She Confronted Netanyahu and then quoted you as their health care summit where you said that you asked Prime Minister Netanyahu to improve compliance with international humanitarian, humanitarian law. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I asked unanimous consent to insert this Washington Post article titled Top Biden Advisor Reveal, Reveals She Confronted Netanyahu into the record. Without objection. Okay. Could you please give us specific instances of violations of international humanitarian humanitarian law on Israel's part? Uh, first of all, I did not say that I confronted, uh, but I had uh, on my trip really important, extensive discussions about the need to improve deconfliction. Do you have any you know, uh, violation of international humanitarian law by Israel? No. Can, can I just, again, just finish the, the I got quick. Point, I got 30, is, 38 seconds. I understand, but you've asked a question. Civilians and humanitarians are dying in very, very large numbers, including most recently the World Central Kitchen strike. So is Israel it, violating international law? To improve the ability to keep civilians safe and to allow humanitarians to do their job as the World Central Kitchen strike. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and I, I got to finish up because I'm running out of time here real quickly. The White House National Security Communication Advisor John Kirby said that the State Department had not found any instances where the Israel has violated international humanitarian law. Who's who's wrong and who's right here? I, I just there, these there, there's conflicting articles based on on two officials of the Biden administration who seem to think that either Israel is conducting an unjust war or they're not in violation. I'm just kind of con confused, and I think maybe. If we're going to make political statements, whether it be by your employees or yourself, it starts to confound the problem of getting your job done. And I think your job is very important. Don't get me wrong. I think what you're doing is incredibly important. And we need to take care of innocent noncombatants that are being 
starved, if you will, or, or not getting the, the service they need to. But I just want to make sure we have a unified process going forward rather than contradictory statements by uh, political people uh, that don't seem to have their act together when it comes to a unifying response. Thank you. With that, I have to yield. I recognize the, recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Power, for all your service to this country over many, many years. I'm over here. Uh, thank you for all your service for many, many years and um, your patience during this hearing. There is no question we need to make sure that there is more humanitarian aid getting into the innocent Palestinians in Gaza. I have a very dear friend in my district whose um, husband's family is in Gaza, and I get regular reports about how they are suffering um, and how um, they would do anything to get rid of Hamas because they believe that it would relieve their suffering. So uh, I'd like to know from you, does Hamas make it more difficult to deliver humanitarian assistance to those who need help in Gaza? All I can tell you, because I'm not there, is the reports from our partners is that that right now is not the impediment. That is not the barrier to getting food to people. I, I like you, would expect it would be. <laughs> given what Hamas does otherwise, targeting innocent civilians, using innocent civilians as human shields. But again, trusted partners like World Food Bank, UNICEF, and others have not reported that Hamas is getting in the way of distributing humanitarian and assistance. I, and I will say, nor are we getting those reports from the IDF who are present on the ground in Gaza. I have been getting reports, in fact, that Hamas is targeting, punishing, or hindering Palestinians who are working with the international community to provide humanitarian assistance. You have not seen any evidence of that. I would be very interested in those reports, but that is not what our partners are reporting back to us. So do you believe that Hamas is benefiting from the aid that we are providing to Gaza? I mean, it's it's. I, I don't even know how to think about that question in this moment when Hamas is on the run and being pursued uh, across Gaza. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think they are in a position because of what the IDF is doing to benefit per se. Would family members of Hamas potentially be getting access at a food distribution? You know, that's possible. It's going to civilians. Do you have any knowledge larger. of how, how Hamas fighters are getting their food? I don't. So, um, it is a difficult balance to, to strike when we desperately want to make sure that innocent Palestinians don't suffer and don't starve, but we don't want to do anything to embolden Hamas. And I have spent today, uh, much of my time this morning, meeting with hostage families. And um, I met with a, a woman whose husband uh, is from North Carolina, the state that I represent, and she was held hostage for 51 days, and her situation was so appalling that she said during her captivity she wished that she had been killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, now she's been waiting for her husband, Keith, for 186 days. And um, one of the things that we are concerned about is how do we make sure that innocent Palestinians don't starve, but how do we avoid emboldening Hamas so that they will not, so that they will release those 136 hostages, including at least five Americans? Well, all I can say is that um, Israel is aggressively pursuing Hamas. Uh, and is seeking to dismantle Hamas, and Hamas fighters are on the run. Um, but whatever that balance is to be struck, it's hard to say that that balance with also the welfare of civilians um, has yet been achieved if you have famine in the north and potentially imminent famine in the south. So, so you're absolutely right that it's weighing the costs and the benefits, and this is just the exchange that I had, again, not long ago in Israel with COGAD, with the IDF, with Israeli officials, 
you know, nobody is saying that this is, <laughs> is easy, um, but a lot of the decisions that the government of Israel made in the early phases of the war, they later went on to reverse. In other words, the decision, you know, not to open Karim Shalom, then they opened Karim Shalom. The decision not to allow fuel in because it was dual use, in the end, they recognize you can't do humanitarian delivery without doing fuel. What we have been saying consistently is just do all of that sooner so that fewer people are, are harmed. And I appreciate the work you do. I truly do. But I know that there is a hostage deal on the table, a ceasefire deal on the table right now. And Hamas is the party that is refusing to accept the deal. And I am deeply worried that there are, are things that we are doing that are preventing Hamas from taking the deal and releasing those hostages, including American citizens, and it keeps me up at night. So my time has expired. Uh, I thank you again for all your service, and I yield back. Thank you. I recognize myself for, for five minutes. Uh, one of the advantages of being so far down the chain is much of the ground has been plowed. Um, I want to focus on what I think is a dangerous part of this uh, Israeli uh, situation Lebanon. Uh, we know about UNRWA. That ground has been plowed. UNIFIL is the, the UN organization in Lebanon. There is an agreement that uh, Hezbollah is not supposed to operate below the Latani River. There is a demilitarized zone there. I believe that USAID uh, supplies like $70 million. Is that correct to, to Lebanon? Is that on the order? That sounds, if it's combining, I don't know if you mean the bilateral programming or the humanitarian. It's, it's more substantial if it includes the humanitarian. But, Got it. but okay. go, go ahead. Very good. But these are the dollars that uh, are given to the government of Lebanon, which is heavily influenced by Hezbollah, as you know. Have you considered uh, the danger of Lebanon uh, exploding? Because there have been displacements. You mentioned the uh, Lebanese displacements. They've also been thousands, tens of thousands of Israeli displacements in the north as well. It's not just the Lebanese that are being displaced. Have you considered the impact of those uh, dollars that we are giving to the Lebanese government, which, and can you, have you considered it? And secondly, do you have any indication that Hezbollah is diverting those dollars as Hamas did uh, for their wartime preparation? Thank you. First, let me just stipulate that I didn't mention Israeli displaced, uh, not out of neglect or a lack of awareness, but only because USAID doesn't work in advanced economies where a democracy like Israel looks out for its own displaced. So it's just we, we work in Lebanon, have a mission uh, doing work uh, to support the Lebanese people. Look, I, I want to look at your what, what you're looking at, but we are certainly not giving $70 million uh, to the Lebanese government, USAID. Our, our work in health, in agriculture, uh, in, in other domains, by and large, I mean, in most countries, is not government-to-government -government assistance. My team will correct me if somehow uh, I missed that on my, on my trip to Lebanon not long ago. Um, uh, so again, our, our work is to make sure that the government is held accountable. Our work is to support independent media that hold them accountable, for example, after the port blast uh, and the like. Our work is to try to strengthen the economy and support SMEs or American University uh, of Beirut uh, so that people have scholarships so they don't turn to Hezbollah later. Um, so again, you, you may be referring to something specific that I'm that I'm not aware of, and I apologize. I'm just uh, yeah. taking administration reports of $67 million. I think when we so. say to Lebanon, though, it's to this range of other other parties. I, I, again, would be very surprised if that was government to government. Okay, I, I would ask you to look at the, the uh, UNIFIL. They are, not, they are not doing their job because Israel has been striking areas south of, uh, in the area of the Wadis Saluki, and, and this is in the demilitarized zone. We need to be using all of our soft power so that we don't have to use hard power later to make sure that Hezbollah, because this is, if Hamas is the B team, Hezbollah is the A team in the area. They have thousands of rockets, uh, that, more than Hamas. This could be very dangerous. Um, I want to move to Qatar. Uh, Qatar plays both sides of the fence. They play both sides of the fence in Afghanistan, uh, they play both sides of the fence with uh, Israel and Hamas. Why, are the, why in the world are we continuing to use Qatar 
uh, in their playing both sides of the fence in both of the situations that they are intimately involved in. Well, on both Unifil and Cutter, your questions are probably uh, better steered um, to Secretary Blinken, who I know is appearing here. Um, I hope he'll forgive me for saying that. Uh, but, you know, look, what, what, I, what I would just say is that anybody who has leverage when hostages are in peril, we are going to seek to use that leverage. And uh, the flip side of it is as you describe, but um, we need Cutter and all countries that have an ounce of leverage over Hamas to use that leverage to insist that these innocent people be returned to their families. And, and so, you know, I think, I think that's something you would do if, if in a position to use that leverage and something we wish to do. We want to see Qatar as well doing more in terms of humanitarian assistance, doing more uh, development work. Uh, we, the United States benefits when more countries are willing uh, to engage in development and help countries become more stable where it isn't, and this is something, again, that I think there's bipartisan consensus, it's always in our interest to share the burden of the kind of work that we've been describing. I'm, I'm not as sanguine as you are because uh, listening to the organizations that are still getting interpreters out of Afghanistan, uh, they are not at all sanguine about Qatar's leverage, to use your word. So um, I, I think we need to not only hold the uh, governments that you're discussing accountable, but Cutter as well. Um, and with that, I yield back and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, your uh, uh, tireless and passionate service to our country is to be commended and, and thank you for extending your time this afternoon. It's a hard job that you have. I want to quickly uh, touch upon three areas in ways that I don't think uh, other, because time is limited, others have questioned um, about Armenia, about Ukraine, and about uh, Gaza. Uh, Armenia is something that you have a lot of experience in. The agreements this last week that took place with the EU initiative um, and uh, our own commitments, uh, I think it's an additional 65 million, if I remember correctly, what role will USA play in the region moving forward? And this, does this include, in your view, uh, increasing humanitarian and development assistance to Armenia? Um, and, and what can Congress do to help support you in that effort? Well, Congressman, as, as we discussed uh, recently, um, Armenia is at an absolutely pivotal inflection point. Um, they associate and, with us and they want to be a Western country and they're in a tough neighborhood. <laughs> very, very tough uh, neighborhood. And I did have the chance to meet with the Prime Minister on Friday uh, along with uh, European Commissioner van der Leyen and, and Secretary Blinken. That was a really historic event, uh, actually, to see that embrace uh, of Prime Minister Pashinyan and the reform efforts his government uh, is making. I think what you'll see is stepped up work across a range of sectors. Uh, their economy is very dependent on their former Soviet um, uh, partners, uh, in, in, including their food security. So right. USAID is looking at uh, investments in the agricultural sector so that they can produce more in the way of wheat, especially uh, at home. We should talk about partnerships there uh, in the um, California, especially in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, a lot of Armenian uh, expats that uh, have been very excellent in agriculture, and there may be some synergy that we could develop. Indeed, and, and I'd love to follow up with you on that. That is something uh, we are trying to do more systematically at USAID, particularly with diaspora communities that are as uh, dynamic as the Armenian uh, community. Uh, but, you know, they need support for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. More than right. 100,000 people no longer have their homes. Uh, one of the things I talked to the Prime Minister about is housing, permanent housing for these people. At the same time, we press Azerbaijan to allow these people if, to have Because of time, if you return. could provide me maybe a little descriptive with your staff, I would appreciate how we could work and follow up on that. Um, on Ukraine, and, and we're all passionate, and I just pray to God that we're going to get this uh, package passed next week for the Ukrainian people, but uh, besides the tanks and bullets, um, the additional assistance uh, necessary to help uh, Ukraine economically and on a humanitarian standpoint, and you talked about how they've exceeded agricultural production in some instances, and it was the breadbasket, but what do you think in, in terms of the, the longer-term efforts? Well, let, let me just 
quote the head of the IMF um, who described Ukraine's economic growth rate this past year, which uh, I think was over 5%, as breathtaking. I mean, what a lot of attention is rightly paid Given the fact to the, they're in the middle of a war. To the bravery of the citizens. Now, you could say when when 30% of your GDP gets, you know, uh, taken out by an aggressor, you know, there's, you can only go up. But that's not even the case. I mean, they have to do the kind of energy repairs that they do on the fly when, when Putin targets their energy infrastructure. The farmers are planting in fields from which they, they had to demine or sometimes wear uh, yeah. protective equipment in order to go out and actually do the harvesting. So the fact that Ukraine has reverted to its pre-invasion agricultural numbers virtually is just extraordinary. Do you want to add that to your long-term descriptive because I want to do, get to Gaza? Well, I, mean. I, I would just say in, in the, they are on a trajectory where if bombs weren't falling and you could unleash the tech uh, capabilities, their tech sector grew by 5% the first year after the war, uh, their young people, uh, the education that they have. I mean, they are on a pathway to Europe, not only because they have the full All the more reason we need to pass this next it's week. It's absolutely indispensable. And if I could just say, there are three buckets, right? There's the direct budget support, which we've had a back and forth on with Congressman Keene. There's humanitarian assistance for the world, of which Ukraine is a part. But there's the development assistance, the support for agriculture, for energy, for anti-corruption. That is the investment in Ukraine's future, and that is in the Senate package as well. And I worry it's not talked about even by the friends of Ukraine. Uh, but that is but USAID's bilateral assistance. I'm glad you got a chance to reiterate to, that just now. Uh, I, tr I tried to. <laughs> if one moment, and this is a comment, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me the discretion. Obviously, averting a famine in Gaza has to be our first priority. That we, we can't in any other way think about that, that we've got to prevent a famine from taking place there. But in your descriptive, again, when reconstruction begins to take place and what that looks like when this war ends in Gaza, um, what what our role is and how we partner with our moderate Arab countries on reconstruction is something I'm very interested in. Well, I think American companies are already engaging and, and will be incredibly important players, but that is why the investments in anti-corruption, in independent media, in open procurement. All of these investments now also put us in a position to see a more optimal form of reconstruction than occurred, say, in Afghanistan. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your time. Thank Madam, you, Congressman. Madam Ambassador. I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator, following January reports that 12 UNRWA employees were involved in the October 7th terrorist attack, the administration halted new money towards UNRWA. In the appropriations package Congress passed recently, we added an additional year-long funding pause. There is no question here, UNRWA must be defunded and disbanded. Uh, there are institutional problems at UNRWA that were present long before October. In fact, there was an amendment to defund UNRWA in the state and foreign operations appropriations bill that was voted on in September of last year. I voted yes on that amendment along with 212 of my colleagues. Now, it wasn't enough for the amendment to pass, but it demonstrates that there was already serious concern with the operations of UNRWA prior to the administration's decision to cut funding. Further, this past November, I led floor debate to pass the Peace and Tolerance and Palestinian Education Act, which discussed the anti-Jewish and anti-Israel curricula taught to children in Gaza and the West Bank curricula taught by UNRWA employees. So while, yes, we appreciate the prohibition on new funding in January, this is long overdue, as there were clear and present issues at UNRWA uh, that looks like were ignored by the administration. Uh, did you have concerns about UNRWA prior to October 7th? You know, we've been here for a few hours, and I've been engaging all the UNRWA questions. I just do want to make clear that USA doesn't fund UNRWA. I don't have any oversight uh, over UNRWA or any engagement with UNRWA, and probably detailed questions, notwithstanding the fact that I've been trying to answer them, uh, are better uh, extended uh, elsewhere. P part of the challenge here uh, about the idea of disbanding um, is that while the, the uh, again, Un inexcusable if the, the allegations are proven true. Uh, nature of, of would you have reason to believe the allegations are untrue? Yeah, I'm not. I, the investigation is underway. I, I think the invest the we would not have suspended funding if we didn't deem the right. allegations credible. Um, but 
you know, I mean, listen, in, in, the, the Administrator, the world, with respect, in your prior role, did you have concern about UNRWA? I'm not going to talk. I mean, there's so much going on in the world now. My prior role ended on January 20th, 2017. Right. And at any point, did you have concern? I also had no uh, funding control over UNRWA in that role, I would note. But, I didn't ask but about funding control. I asked here's about the, concern. Here's the challenge, which is often... Administrator, I asked you a specific question. Did yes, you have concern? Yes, I did concern? engage. I did engage, okay. and I did, of course, the, right. the textbook concerns uh, members of the administration. The challenge is, and it was not a Democratic administration... Uh, that pushed uh, for elections in Gaza, but those elections did give rise to the election of Hamas. Hamas was the state before now uh, the Israeli war to dismantle the state, and the state in every nation has a lot of say over textbooks. And that was true for a UN agency that worked, as it were, at the pleasure of the state. We may not like the fact that those elections that the United States pushed for produced the outcome of Hamas as the leadership. I certainly don't like that. You don't like it. Um, uh, putting people who want to eliminate another people in power is not anything that anybody would have wished. But the effect is that the governing institution had a fair amount of, had, you know, significant leverage over the UN agency that was carrying right. out uh, It's a terrorist state that has had control over this agency, which is in part why uh, we have pushed uh, to defund it. Uh, would you support future year uh, appropriations uh, defunding UNRWA? I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to the King of Jordan, for example. Yes, I have. You, I've had I've had dinner with him uh, in Jordan. And about the, about what it is going to mean for the Jordanian people to have two million young people not you know, basically looking for where their schools are going to get support for. Now, it may be that the Europeans and others come in and address this well, issue, and it doesn't fall to Defunding UNRWA him. does not mean that we don't deal with humanitarian issues. It doesn't mean that we don't deal with education. No, no, but it, it just is the school system. Right. It is doesn't the school mean that we don't for deal with it. Million it means we find a different vehicle by which to do this. But UNRWA itself has proven there, to be corrupt. But as, uh, you've been here... And, for it's much of the exchange, there's no NGO, corrupt. there's no UN agency that creates school systems. That right. that's not you don't. There's no like U-Haul where there's a school system that you just deploy in Jordan to I, educate 2.6 million Jordanian kids. It doesn't. It just doesn't work that way. So yeah. what Re I'm saying is that that be taken into account. Respectfully, being being uh, you know snide about it is not actually solving the issue here. The reality is UNRWA is not the vehicle by which we should be sending American taxpayer dollars at this point. It's just not. And we will follow and, the law. And we should, and what, right. My question to you was, do you support moving forward? I'm describing the benefits it. of educating young people across the region and providing health services, and I'm not seeing a viable alternative. So I would suggest... So you, so you believe we should continue I, to fund on I, I think, first of all, we don't know what Gaza is going to look like uh, after this war ends, hopefully. Uh, Hamas will be dismantled and new institutions will be in place whereby they will take care of educating their own young people and you won't need a UN agency to do it. Right. But it is extremely important that we look out for young people in Gaza. It is going to do, do nobody any favors for them not to have no, access in, to an in, education. In fact, the fact is on October 7th, part of the reason that you had that type of terrorist attack is because of the level of hatred and anti-Semitism that is taught in schools in Gaza. That is part of the problem here. And UNRWA helped in terms of uh, allowing for that to occur under the guise of UN agency. It is disgusting. It is shameful. And the fact that we, as the United States, have helped support that organization, helped fund it, is an embarrassment. And yeah. that's why and that's why we fought to defund it. The gentleman's Understood. time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, draw our attention to European issues, uh, and, and particularly Ukraine, Central Europe, and Georgia. Um, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, comment uh, and critique of the administration today, uh, you know, on, on issues to Ukraine in particular. Uh, and I must say that uh, the most important issue at this moment, uh, a pivotal moment in this war, uh, is the supplemental aid to Ukraine, uh, the bipartisan Senate package that's been sitting there. Uh, without that, Ukraine could lose this war, and we'd be fighting a, a new front uh, under Article 5 uh, with American troops on the ground. Uh, and the name, there's one person holding this up, 
and he's not in the administration. His name is Speaker Johnson. One person is holding this up, uh, holding it up from, I think, support maybe upwards of 300 members of Congress to support this. So when we're talking about critiques and, and trying to be critical, let's start with the obvious. We're sitting here today at this moment in history uh, that's so pivotal, and one person is holding it up. Not a very democratic uh, action when 300 members, I believe, of, uh, of Congress want to vote for that. Uh, with Ukraine, uh, I'd like to I'll give you, a, I'll go through all three, Administrator, and see uh, to give you enough time. But uh, it's important to know uh, some of the funding that's there uh, from the United States and how important some of our loans are and how it would affect the financial standing of Ukraine, the ability to do the kind of things you talked about uh, economically and survive, you know, with the financial standing with the IMF and the World Bank, without those loans uh, and how important that is. Uh, secondly, uh, with Central Europe, uh, I, I want to uh, just commend you on the work for the very small amount of money that's there. This is a hybrid war with Russia. They are trying to not just have a war of aggression with Ukraine, they're, they're trying to deal with the conflict all through Europe using disinformation and other activities. And uh, I just want to say that the work that's being done, pro-democracy work that's being done there to counter this is, is so critical, uh, dealing with backsliding countries, particularly when we have countries like R Hungary, uh, you know, with some of their actions, Slovakia, with the support of uh, uh, some of their uh, a lack of support there towards Ukraine and the rest of uh, Europe in that regard. Uh, and let me uh, finally deal with Georgia, uh, where uh, the Georgian dream leaders have announced legislation which mirrors Russia's uh, restrictive and repressive foreign agent law and announced legislation that would crack down on freedom of, of expression, similar to the Russian foreign agent law that's uh, crippling journalism and, and a free press. And also uh, in Georgia, how we continue to work in Georgia to support Georgia's European uh, Union accession progress, yet uh, there's concern again with legislation that's being proposed that would crack down on freedom of expression with regards to the LGBTQ uh, plus individuals in Georgia. And I gave you a lot to go through, uh, but these are very important issues. Uh, so if you could take the rest of the time to uh, address those issues. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for mentioning all of them. Um, you know, on Ukraine, uh, I've said this before, in the context of humanitarian assistance, but I really want to stress that the word supplemental is a misnomer because we moved our base assistance to Ukraine into supplementals, rightly or wrongly. You all make the rules up here and write the bills. Um, it was incredibly generous infusion of support uh, deserved, of course, uh, by these incredibly courageous and resilient people. And we have put that money to unbelievably effective use. Uh, and again, you know, to talk about the rate at which their economy is growing, to talk about the changed, in, <laughs> believe it or not, the changed business operating environment, that the anti-corruption indicators, but, you know. Because I, I just ahead. wanted to give you a chance on the other topics, but humanitarian <laughs> aid is like a misnomer. I mean, we're talking about funding. Well, they're two different buckets. First right? responders, and the, the, we're talking about uh, dealing with uh, preserving the energy grid. The country would collapse and Putin would win if we aren't doing those things. So it's beyond humanitarian, completely, but if completely. I put on Central Europe and Georgia. No, but I mean, we do humanitarian assistance, right? That is about giving vouchers to displaced people who wouldn't otherwise have access to food or you know, free medical care or psychosocial support. But these investments in the economy are what are going to put Ukraine in a position, I, I use the example of the Republic of Korea at the beginning of my opening statement of going from being a recipient of assistance to now $5 billion a year as a development partner. That's what Ukraine is going to be. They've already set up the shell of their new development, their new USAID, Ukraine aid, that is going to be our partner uh, working in other countries exporting technology. I just want to mention one of the Central European countries, Moldova, which also is on a brave democratic path that has brought it uh, nothing but risk uh, and uh, a lot of misinformation and interference from Russia, but they are working to render their economy, to turn their economy to the West, to fight corruption, uh, to enhance tech and, and other uh, skills in their young people so more people stay in Moldova. That's a success story. And on Georgia, just a very sad uh, turn of events in terms of some of these anti-democratic moves particularly sad in light of the strides that Georgia has made combating corruption, because a lot of those who will be most chilled if this foreign agent's law passes are those that hold the government accountable 
and that have been absolutely vital in rooting out corruption over, over many decades. Georgia had been a real exemplar uh, in terms of enhancing transparency, open procurement, and the like. So uh, I think in, in, in all of these areas, uh, again, there's more work to be done, uh, but it comes back to we want to be catalytic with any resources we are given. I want to turn $1 into $2, $3, $4, uh, including by crowding in the private sector, working with the DFC and others. But we do need these foundational resources. And our Ukraine bilateral assistance that supports energy, agriculture, the economy, the tech sector, and the anti-corruption efforts live within the development assistance bucket that is in the supplemental. Uh, so without that supplemental, that work will not be able to continue as it has. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. I recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Administrator uh, Power, I am mindful of your time. We are well beyond your hard stop. Do you have time for five more minutes? For you, of course. No, You've no. You've waited all this time. And I, so. I could do it privately with you if you wish. Oh, no, of course. I think Thank you've you, been please. incredibly uh, patient. Thank you for your work, for the work of your whole team around the world. Uh, and of course, a lot of our focus today uh, is um, in Gaza, is in the, the plight between Israel uh, and Hamas war and what is going on in Gaza. Uh, we have an expression here I associate myself with, uh, the good gentleman's remarks. I want to be really clear. I do not associate myself with some of the remarks that I have heard this afternoon regarding UNRWA. To me, it shows a real misunderstanding of the work that they do. I was there in February. I was there also in November. So twice since this war began, we met with UNRWA officials uh, at that time, in February, they had lost 147 members of their team killed in this conflict. The number is now over 200, as I understand it. And so that horror was brought uh, so vividly to life uh, following Israel's killing of seven World Central Kitchen workers in those three vehicles. Horrifying, absolutely horrifying. But to call for the defunding of UNRWA they are angels on the ground. I am hypercritical of the alleged 12 or 15 who may have been infiltrating as Hamas, who may have participated in the October 7th horrendous barbaric attack. But you don't throw everybody and all the good work out. Because I, I want to ask you, if we continue this pause, if the world said we will not help you, UNRWA, you're however, thousands of, of workers who are on the ground who keep coming to work even when their families, whole families, are killed, what will happen with famine in Gaza if we just shut it down? No more UNRWA. By the way, they're not educating. We know that. They can't even do that now. They have incredibly important vaccines and medical uh, um, aid to, to be a part of, but the essentialness of food and water. What happens if we continue this disinformation campaign of defund UNRWA? Um, well, first, thank you for uh, bringing some facts into the conversation that I, I probably should have raised before, uh, including just the horrific loss of life for those who work uh, for UNRWA and in general, you know, more than 220 aid workers uh, killed uh, by IDF or in my IDF military operations uh, to this point. Um, including most recently, of course, the World Central Kitchen colleagues, uh, devastatingly. Um, and thank you also for uh, reminding us all, uh, but UNRWA is an organization in Gaza alone of 13,000 people. Right. Um, and the vast majority of those people have, uh, you know, not been propagating hate, but have been actually trying to educate young people. The literacy rate in Gaza, I think, is something like 99%. Astounding. It's one of the most, I should say, Gaza West Bank. Uh, it's one of the most um, uh, effective literacy efforts, uh, you know, in any of the places that USAID works. In terms of what would happen if the whole thing shut down, right now, it looks like other countries are stepping up to avert that scenario. Um, but, you know, I, I just cannot overstate how chaotic and how horrific the conditions in Gaza are. You've spoken to them. The visuals speak to the level of destruction. There's no workaround 
for the infrastructure that they provide now. You know, after the war, when there's a new administration of Gaza, if that comes about, uh, obviously that's itself extremely complicated. Um, you know, the question of who is providing education as they try to rebuild virtually everything from scratch in the education and the health sector, you know, some of these questions will be, will be addressed. But right now, there is no way to avert large-scale famine without relying on the humanitarian backbone that has been UNRWA for decades and that remains UNRWA today. That doesn't mean, again, that, I mean, we are going to follow the law. We are going to work through other partners. Um, but even, as I started to say this earlier, even the government of Israel, which had banned UNRWA participation in convoys because of the food crisis and U.S. engagement, I hope, uh, has now decided that UNRWA can, in fact, be part of convoys going to the north because they recognize there's just no other way. Right. And I want to uh, commend um, to anybody uh, to please meet with uh, the director of UNRWA who is stationed in uh, Rafa, uh, a 20-plus year U.S. military veteran. Uh, I don't know how people stay at this kind of work uh, with the risks uh, that they are taking, but they are there. Uh, he was very clear about that, which is uh, the, their challenges on the ground. Uh, and I want to go back to where you began, which is it is incumbent upon us. It is malpractice that we have not passed the National Security Supplemental. I'm urgent on it for Ukraine, of course, of course, for your continued work with USAID, USAID but humanitarian aid both for Israel and for Palestine, for Gazans, for the West Bank. I thank you for your work. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill. <laughs> Hello, Ambassador. We're welcome. We're glad to have you back uh, before us today. Thanks for all the time you're devoting to the mission around the world and spending time uh, here with the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I want to thank you, really, for your magnificent leadership and the time you've been in office. Um, as it relates to helping Ukraine, uh, you and I have talked about this extensively, and I want to talk to you about the good work of this committee on the Repo Act, which uh, Mike McCall introduced, and I worked uh, with him to amend rather significantly, but we got a very strong vote here, I think 40 to 2, and over in the Senate, uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, something similar, 20 to 2, something of that nature. Uh, do you support uh, Russian assets that are currently frozen being seized and put in a UN or international fund for the benefit of Ukraine current budget needs or reconstruction? Um, absolutely welcome uh, the chairman's leadership, your leadership, um, that of Senator Whitehouse, uh, Senator Risch, and others. Um, I mean, this is extremely important. It would be important anyway uh, as a signal to Russia that you have to pay for, for what you did, that there is not the kind of impunity that Putin has become used to or seems to have become used to. Um, but it's also important because we need all the resources that we can get. The Ukrainians need all the resources that they can get uh, to rebuild. We know that they use their resources extremely effectively. We know that in using those resources, they are making sacrifices and taking strides on behalf of freedom for all of the rest of us. And I think this is an incredibly uh, important tool. Of course, we're trying to coordinate with the G7 to make sure that we are acting uh, yep. collectively, uh, given where the vast majority of those assets right. are stored. And, I, and I've seen Foreign, uh, Foreign Secretary Cameron and Prime Minister Sunak have certainly been supportive. The Council on Europe will vote on April 16th to do this. So I think we really need to be a leader. I think the United States needs to lead, and that will help uh, Europe make the best decisions. It's true we only have 5 to $6 billion of those Russian Federation sovereign assets here, and it's certainly closer to almost $300 billion in Europe. But I think our leadership here is important. Thank you for that. Uh, I know that you've led in humanitarian efforts in Ukraine, and one of those is in agriculture and restarting agriculture. I haven't heard much discussion about that today. Thanks to uh, American Lethal Aid and that from France and from Great Britain, I won't leave anybody out, I'll say allied nations, the Black Sea is now open for business, is that right? Yes, it is. And, and that means we contribute less resources to uh, the government in Kyiv if in fact uh, Ukraine is exporting foodstuffs, fertilizer, others? Yeah, I mean, Putin's, 
stepped up bombardment isn't helping their ledger, right? So they've increased exports almost, I mean, have had even months where the agricultural exports exceed their pre-invasion levels, which is just breathtaking in, as a tribute to them and as a testament to the good that our support, I think, is doing. Um, at the same time, you know, the attacks on the energy infrastructure are of a ferocity and intensity that we, we, we thought you couldn't set new lows uh, for brutality, but, but each week uh, Putin seems to be setting them. So Well, I think, that's, uh, I think that's certain. He's trying to rival his predecessor, Stalin, and how many people he can kill around the world in Russia, in Ukraine, in Syria, in uh, other places through his proxy support. Let me turn to that other country, if I could, which is Syria. USAID is supportive of aid in northwest Syria. Is that correct? Uh, depends on the form of aid, but yes. Uh, the Bihar organization that uh, runs much of the aid in northwest Syria out of Turkey and Iraq receives USAID support? I, I think so. I, the details I, I, I'm not familiar with. Uh, since the earthquake, has it been hard to get aid into northwest Syria? Um, yes, as you know from your 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 travels, um, but I think the the teams are doing their best to to find workarounds. Uh, I just that stabilization funding there that's something that the U.S. has supported. The Bihar organization is just one organization that's doing it. Is that that's still a priority for us to work with neighboring countries to try to provide aid to Northwest Syria? Is it not? It is, again, part of what is happening across the board is the very substantial cuts are requiring cuts everywhere. So I think every region that is experiencing those cuts thinks that they are being singled out because of some <laughs> policy shift. But in fact, uh, when your budget shrinks by 40% and global needs go up by, in the humanitarian space and global needs go up by 35, 40%, you know, that, that's what we're facing. So that's probably what is at work here, but I'm happy to dig into any specifics. Look forward to following up with you. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back and I want to thank uh, the ambassador, the director for her hard work on behalf of America's uh, interests around the world. Yield back. Thank you, Congressman. I thank the administrator for her valuable testimony. Uh, and for the members for their questions, I, uh, the members may have more questions, and I ask that you respond to those in writing. Pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record subject to length limitations. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>